three hours and 15 minutes, a congressional panel looks at the Clinton administration's actions during last month's government shutdown. Officials from the Labor Department, Health and Human Services, Treasury, Social Security, and other departments talk about how their agencies planned for the shutdown and how they responded to it. Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting of the House uh, Subcommittee on Civil Service to order. And uh, the subject of today's hearing is uh, government shutdown and uh, what is essential. Uh, I'll start off this morning's uh, hearing by uh, wel welcoming our uh, witnesses and guests and fellow colleagues this morning. And I have an opening statement, then we'll hear from some of the other uh, members. Uh, today, the subcommittee will be reviewing the government shutdown, both as it affected our federal workforce recently and what might happen in the event of a future government lapse in appropriations. Any review of the, of the government shutdown must center on what activities of the federal government are essential and which are non-essential. The Constitution of the United States is clear in Article 1, Section 9 that, <clears throat> and I'll quote, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of an appropriation made by law. Despite this constitutional restriction, we recognize that certain functions of our government are in fact essential, and its workforce must continue to operate even when appropriations do lapse. By tradition, it is the President, together with OMB and the individual agencies that have been allowed to decide which functions and agencies are essential and which, in fact, are to be shut down. Part of the reason that I and uh, other members, uh, new members, have sought election to uh, Congress uh, was really to, uh, to come here with the intention of exploring these issues in a broader context. In our attempt to balance the federal budget, we deal with this issue uh, directly as we decide what, in fact, are essential national functions and activities. That, of course, is part of a larger question as we consider the proper role of our federal government, including other alternatives such as privatizing, downsizing, or shifting responsibilities to state and local authorities. However, no one can deny the fact that taxpayers and the average citizen outside the, the Beltway must ask some very serious questions when large segments of our federal government close down and they see no appreciable, appreciable differences in their lives. Inside the Beltway, many people spoke of assessing blame for the government sh uh, shutdown of non-essential services. Outside the Beltway, many citizens and taxpayers applauded closing down non-essential government activities. Others outside the, the Beltway who have grown dependent on federal government benefits and services were in fact appalled and dismayed and had their lives uh, se severely disrupted by the shutdown. In this hearing today, I hope we can review first what took place in the recent uh, shutdown and secondly, what, are, what plans are under consideration for any future government closure. It's important to note that the shutdown itself has not been a new idea uh, to this administration. I believe it was part of a, a calculated strategy by the administration to close down the government and, in fact, uh, and do uh, that closure this year. Planning for this supposedly spontaneous shutdown began as early as July of this year. In September, agencies were required to submit shutdown plans to OMB. This was in marked contrast to the first shutdown, which occurred under President Reagan in 1981, when the first uh, OMB guidance to agencies was issued less than a week before employees were sent home. In spite of the current administration's advanced planning, it's unfortunate the execution of the shutdown was in many instances a disorganized and illogical at best and oftentimes a chaotic uh, uh, experience. For example, let me, get, let me cite a couple of examples here. And we've got people that will speak to this as witnesses. The Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, initially re 
released all but 136 of nearly 12,000 employees. As a result, some housing programs were shut down, even though funds were available for many major housing programs. Even with a 90% retention rate at the Department of Veterans Affairs, Affairs, the administration announced that the processing of new applications for some major veterans' benefits programs would be suspended. Within a week of the shutdown, the White House announced a recall of more than 1,700 DVA employees. The Department of Education, uh, as another example, furloughed 86 percent of its workforce, while the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms found it necessary uh, to attain so-called essential 15 of 23 public affairs officers. The Social Security Administration furloughed 90 percent of its workforce. Retirement claims processing ceased. At the same time, retirement claims for civil service retirees at the Office of Personnel Management were being processed at a 100 percent uh, capacity uh, and activity rate. Three days into the furlough, the President initiated a recall of more than 50,000 Social Security personnel, raising questions about whether they should have been furloughed in the first place. Furthermore, in the middle of the shutdown, the President declared the activities non-essential on, uh, some of them non-essential on Monday, when on Friday these uh, same functions were uh, suddenly termed essential. It's important that we look at the discrepancies and review the agencies uh, and see what is in fact a, a, a priority activity. We must also examine what activities are more costly to close down uh, than uh, to continue. And finally, we must consider federal employees whose lives uh, are so severely disrupted by this disorderly process. This may have been a well-planned shutdown, but I find some of the results very confusing. We heard a lot of rhetoric. We saw a lot of posturing and grandstanding from the administration. As cold reality set in, we even saw backpedaling and employees recalled. And what about the question, what is essential? The administration seems not to have defined this consistently among uh, its various agencies. Was this poor management or premeditation? Should Congress have established uh, better criteria or more better defined uh, guidelines? The priorities seem evident to me. First and foremost, we have a responsibility to ensure national security. We have a duty to provide for the effective enforcement of our laws. We must take adequate measures to guarantee the public safety, health, and welfare. Next, we must ensure that those who cannot sustain themselves are provided for adequately. Most of these functions were deemed essential uh, last month. Most were carried out only, uh, with only minor in interruptions. But it is important that we look at the discrepancies in the implementation of the administration's first shutdown, if only to make certain that we avoid these problems in the future. We face the prospect of another shutdown affecting several agencies uh, here today within just a matter of uh, uh, 10 days. We remain committed to approving legislation that will continue operations. But if another veto does shut down these agencies, we hope this hearing will result in a more consistent criteria for closures and more effective operations of continuing activities. To explore these issues, we have assembled a panel of senior officials who have had responsibility for the management of major agencies that have implemented the shutdown in a variety of ways. They include um, Dr. Walter Broadnox, the um, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Mr. Dwight Robinson, Acting Deputy Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Mr. Thomas Glenn, uh, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor. Mr. George Munez, uh, Assistant Secretary for Management and Chief Financial Officer of the Department of Treasury. Mr. Gene Brickhouse, Assistant uh, Secretary for Human Resources and Administration of the Department of Veterans Affairs. And Mrs. Uh, Shirley Chater, uh, Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Our second panel 
<coughs> includes uh, Mr. John Koskigan, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Uh, Christopher Sh uh, Schrader, Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice, and Mr. Alan Hewerman, uh, Associate Director for Human Resource Systems Service of, uh, in the Office of uh, Personnel Management. Uh, those are my opening remarks and comments. Uh, I will yield now to the uh, ranking uh, member of our panel, uh, the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad you're having this hearing on the government shutdown that never should have happened. In my view, it was clearly the Congress's fault. We did not get our appropriation bills passed in time. We had a year to do it, and we didn't do it. There was only one, in my recollection, out of 13 bills that was enacted. Uh, there was a lot of complaint over the fact that the President vetoed the legislative branch appropriations bill, but uh, thank God he did. That would have been the worst thing to have had uh, the Congress paid and none of the rest of the government paid because we took care of our own uh, 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 salaries and operation expenses before the rest of the government. So I'm glad he vetoed that, but the fact is that we didn't get the appropriation bills passed. That's why we had the government shut down and then uh, we deliberately sent a continuing resolution to the President calculated to draw a veto. Now, I, I grant you that the Speaker tried to lend some insight into why that happened by going into the fact that he didn't get a window seat on the plane to the Middle East or we went out the wrong door or something. But, but uh, I don't think it was so much uh, uh, the uh, personal snubbing that he uh, uh, perceived occurred as uh, the fact that the legislative branch uh, did not act in, a, uh, in an efficient and effective way. Uh, the reconciliation bill is far less important than getting these appropriations bills signed. And that, uh, in the future, should be our highest priority. But 40 percent of the government did not operate as a result uh, for four days. And uh, I think that's a, uh, something we should be uh, ashamed of. Uh, we also ought to be embarrassed at the fact that we spent $700 million of taxpayers' money and got no work out of it, no uh, uh, return from the federal employees who were uh, furloughed, all of whom wanted to be at work performing their job. None of them wanted to be getting paid for doing nothing, but all of them, uh, 800,000, were sent home. I think uh, that we need to clarify what is essential and non-essential in the first place. Uh, the, um, uh, the definition that suggests that it, oh, and in fact I, I have the directive here, uh, er, essential employees are only those where uh, if they were unable to perform their job, the failure to perform those functions would result in an imminent threat to the safety of human life or the protection of property. Uh, there's an inconsistent application of that criteria, uh, but the functioning of the federal government goes far beyond that. Obviously, national park officials, for example, are not going to be involved in uh, the uh, safety of human life or protection of property for the most part, but they are important for the proper functioning of the federal government. Uh, the um, uh, people who issue visas, uh, we had any number of people in my uh, jurisdiction, I'm sure they are uh, throughout the country, uh, who, uh, who needed visas, who needed to be able to travel, who couldn't get them. One woman's uh, family uh, member was dying and she couldn't get there because the people who uh, would have issued her a visa uh, we're not able to, to get to work. Uh, the Social Security applications, the applications for veterans' benefits uh, were not processed uh, when they were supposed to, when people were eligible. Uh, the fact is that millions of dollars was wasted every day that uh, should have been collected and, uh, and wasn't. Uh, I know we're gonna, going to find a number of discrepancies between the various federal agencies and the way that they interpreted uh, the, uh, the guidelines. 
and as a result some were harder hit than others not just because uh, some of the functions uh, relate to the uh, uh, safety of human life and protection of property more than others but because of different interpretations I think uh, that's due to a sincere effort to do the right thing and, and uh, simply differences in honest judgment. Uh, the, um, uh, the hearing that we're having today is particularly important because it could happen again. Uh, the con continuing resolution expires on December 15th. It's conceivable we could have another government shutdown at that time. We're making absolutely no process on the seven-year balanced budget bill. Uh, we've agreed on how many people are going to sit at the table and what table it is, but we haven't gone beyond that. So uh, that being the case and the fact that we're running out of time, I don't see any possibility of all of these bills being resolved. So a continued resolution is clearly going to be necessary. I would hope that there would be a simple extension of the continuing resolution. Uh, if there, uh, uh, there is not, uh, then the, uh, the public is going to be absolutely right in, in uh, identifying the source of the problem, and it is us as far as I'm concerned. They, back in 1990, uh, almost two out of three uh, taxpayers figured it was the Congress's fault, and the figures were almost identical uh, this year as, uh, as well. I think they're going to be higher if it happens again. Uh, so I think it behooves us to take measures now to avert this. One of the things that we could do is to pass legislation, and it ought to originate in this subcommittee, uh, that um, I've introduced and Congressman Geekus from Pennsylvania has introduced, that would have federal employees go to work in the event of any lapse of appropriations. Uh, they would be reimbursed after the fact, uh, but um, at least the taxpayer would get uh, effort for the money that is being paid for federal employees salaries. Uh, it would not disrupt uh, the ability of uh, the federal workforce to serve the public. Uh, the uh, Speaker Gingrich made it clear in a letter that he gave to um, Republican members of the Congress that he was committed to paying federal employees, including the, all federal employees, including those who were furloughed. Uh, so this simply ensures that they would be performing work during that period of time. Um, I, so I can't imagine why people would be opposed to that other than for the uh, political leverage that it gains people to uh, be able to threaten the possibility of a government shutdown. Uh, that's wholly irresponsible. I, I think we also need to, to take into consideration the people employed in the private sector who were severely uh, and adversely affected by the shutdown. Uh, the people in the services, the retail sector and uh, government contracting and procurement, uh, they don't, uh, the losses that they suffered are not made up. They don't get any re retroactive pay and particularly in this Washington area, uh, there's uh, a lot of people who were hurt unjustifiably and unnecessarily. Uh, it's H.R. 2184 that we've introduced. I would hope we would, uh, we would uh, consider that in this subcommittee and pass it on in an expeditious fashion. Beyond that, I, I'm anxious to get into this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I'm glad we have the occasion to see how it worked and uh, I, I hope even more importantly to get to work to make sure that this does not occur again. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and uh, would now like to yield to the uh, chairman of the uh, full committee who's joined us this morning, uh, Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you also for holding this hearing on the effect of the partial shutdown of the federal government on civil service staff and uh, government functions. A great deal of planning and work went into the shutdown plans of the agencies, and we're here to learn about the actions taken by the federal cabinet departments and independent agencies to prepare for a possible appropriations impasse, whether they took the appropriate steps to troubleshoot their own plans and ask for help when they need it from the Office of Management and Budget. I think we also want to know what actions OMB and or the Department of Justice and the Office of Personnel Management took 
to assist in the planning, uh, to help guide the agencies and to troubleshoot the problem areas before a funding hiatus occurred. Dr. Rivlin and numerous other administration officials were commenting publicly on the potential shutdown of the government really for months before it actually took place. As early as July 26, I believe, Dr. Rivlin cautioned agencies to take no actions such as reductions in force, office closings, or similar measures until we have had, we have had time to assess the developing situation and put together a government-wide plan, was, was her quote. By memo dated August 17th of uh, this year, she directed the agencies to develop and submit for review any plans that you believe are appropriate, she said, and she assured the agencies that OMB would, quote, review plans promptly and get back to the agencies with suggestions, close quote. And again, on November 9th, she instructed agencies to begin to implement the plan, quote, as approved by OMB in September, close quote. So clearly, OMB had been planning for the funding hiatus since midsummer and had also accepted full responsibility for reviewing and approving the plans and otherwise managing a cessation in government operations. However, we find that during the shutdown, inconsistencies became apparent in the treatment and status of employees who perform very similar, if not identical, functions. For example, the Department of Veterans Affairs makes benefit payments for pensions and compensation. In its shutdown procedure, the VA strictly adhered to the Anti-Deficiency Act and veterans' compensation was determined to be unpayable because it is funded through annual appropriations. The Social Security Administration also, however, makes payments for pensions and compensation. But here, uh, even though the Social Security Administration is funded through indefinite appropriations, the SSA shut down to only 7 percent of its workforce. On what basis, then, were these disparate decisions made? Is this a distinction based on funding stream only? I'm also curious to know whether sufficient guidance was given by OPM for the agencies to adequately prepare their shutdown contingency plans. The contingency plans of the Department of Health and Human Services was a mere two pages long, one of which was a chart and the other a cover memo to Nancy Ann Min of the Office of Management and Budget. And by contrast, the contingency plan for the U.S. Department of Labor was an impressive uh, and extensive 184 pages long with the Treasury Department a close second at 174 pages long. In its review of the plans, did OMB consider the HHS shutdown plan to be, uh, to be adequate uh, at two pages? Also, why were certain safety functions, which are necessary to protect human life, treated differently as we understand it? The Mine Safety and Health Administration had more than 1,400 safety inspectors on duty during the furlough. By contrast, uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration retained a staff of about 250. No child labor inspectors were retained. Do child labor inspectors perform a safety function? I really continue to be somewhat puzzled by this apparently disparate treatment of safety functions, and I look forward to hearing an explanation of this issue from the Department of Labor this morning. Were any of these inconsistencies observed by OMB in their review of the plans? And of what did OMB's review and approval process consist? How was this, uh, the bottom line is, how was this shutdown managed? In 1994, the Office of Management Budget merged its budget and management functions. And at that time, I sent a letter to then Director uh, Panetta expressing my concern. Uh, I was joined in that by, uh, by the then Chairman Conyers, uh, expressing uh, our concern about the impact of the OMB's reorganization on its management of the federal government. In examining this shutdown, I'm again uh, concerned that the management functions of OMB have been overshadowed by the ongoing budget work. And frankly, I am concerned that OMB may not have reviewed the <coughs> shutdown plans thoroughly enough, at least on the basis of, uh, of the information we have seen so far. If they had, it seems that they would have seen these serious inconsistencies in the plans and would have taken steps to address them. The partial shutdown of the Federal Government is an extremely complex process. If we have learned nothing else of this exercise, we have learned exactly how complex and complicated it is. It requires a tremendous amount of planning and sound judgment. It is my hope that OMB will assess the responsibility it has for properly managing future shutdowns so that expectations are fair and clear and confusion and inconsistency is minimized. Frankly, we hope we never have to go through this again, but if we do, it surely needs to be better uh, thought out beforehand. Finally, I wonder whether the subcommittee might consider recommending that there be a process within OMB by which shutdown plans will be reviewed and through which agencies can formally 
resolve questions and appeal those decisions. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask you, Hammond, to consent that the letter I referred to from myself and Mr. Conyers to Mr. Matata with regard to the management functions of OMB dated June 21, 1994, be included in the record at this point? Without objection, so ordered. I thank the gentleman uh, for his uh, opening statement. I'd like to yield now to Ms. Morella. Uh, Ms. Morella from Maryland is recognized uh, for her opening statement. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend you um, for convening this hearing. Last month, we experienced the longest government shutdown in our history. So for me, there is no more opportune time to examine the criteria used by the administration to determine what functions would remain operational during the shutdown, particularly with December 15th staring us in the face. I didn't want to shut down. No member of this subcommittee or full committee wanted it. The shutdown was a terrible experience. It was a demoralizing and divisive ordeal for our workforce. It was costly and disruptive to the taxpayers. It hurt a number of businesses, particularly in this local area. Clearly, I wish the President could have signed a continuing resolution that would have kept the entire government running. But for me, this hearing is not about that. This hearing is about reviewing the policies and the implementation of those policies so we can devise solutions to better determine what needs improving and to fix what is broken. It's also about sitting here and talking through this matter so that just maybe we wouldn't have to be in this position again. There are issues that need to be reconciled. I have a hard time understanding, for instance, why cancer researchers were not considered essential. I think most of you know how cancer has affected my life. I'm not certain, but I've heard also that AIDS research may have been affected during this period. And the fact that the Department of Veterans Affairs were recalling employees to process claims for disabled veterans indicates some confusion over how the policy was implemented. Our veterans need special treatment. If the current policies don't afford this treatment, let's fix them. Before I conclude my statement, there are two other issues that I, I think need to be addressed. I've been reading statements in the paper and hearing people say that federal workers who were furloughed came out ahead because they received their pay. And I was one who advocated that they not be victimized. And now I realize there's a question of equity out there and we need to examine that in the future. But I find that these statements are highly offensive and insensitive and an affront to the dedicated men and women who serve this nation and who, through no fault of their own, were furloughed. I don't know how you come out ahead after having to wear the demoralizing title of non-essential. I don't know how you come out ahead while you're sitting at home wondering how long it will last and how you and, or your colleagues will pay the, your bills in the interim. There was not one federal worker screaming, please, please furlough me. So I hope that this will be an end of that kind of rhetoric. I also feel that the term non-essential must be eliminated from the federal vocabulary. I can't think of a term more misguided or misleading. And with that said, I again want to thank uh, uh, Chairman uh, Micah for calling the hearing, for his indulgence, and also uh, uh, look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady, and now I would like to yield to uh, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, Mr. Bass from New Hampshire. Mr. Thank Bass. you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an opening statement that I'd like to submit for the record uh, and to uh, simply comment to thank you for holding the hearing this morning. I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses. I agree with my colleague, uh, Mrs. Morella, that the term non-essential does not necessarily mean unneeded or unnecessary. And I think what we, what we need to determine is in the course of these hearings is what the, what the nature, what the effect of the shutdown was on the operation of government, the difference between what worked and what didn't work in government, what was reactive versus proactive in terms of government activities, and uh, perhaps we can learn more about the internal workings of the federal <laughs> bureaucracy and what we can learn, and perhaps what we can learn from this experience 
uh, how to run a better, more efficient government, but certainly not uh, 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 stereotype anybody who is furloughed as being, quote, non-essential. So I want to thank the chairman for calling these hearings. I think they're important. I think they're timely, and I look forward to hearing this uh, testimony today, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman and now yield to Mr. Horn from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to sit with your committee during uh, these hearings. As chairman of the committee, subcommittee on general government, we have major concerns about the processes by which these decisions were made. Uh, let me just say that I agree with what I have heard from the gentleman from Virginia, the chairman, uh, gentlewoman from uh, both Maryland and the gentleman from New Hampshire. There's a lot of significant questions, and I commend you for these hearings. I hope you will recommend to the full committee and thus the House the criteria by which these decisions have been made. My particular concern comes on an incident that occurred in my own district, and that is the Department of Defense withdrew the C-17 inspectors from the line, and if this shutdown had lasted a few more days, approximately five to 10,000 workers would have been furloughed because there's no way you can keep production going unless the appropriate inspection has been made along the way. Now, if that policy was across the nation, which I suspect it was, having talking, uh, talking to various officials in the Pentagon, uh, I think it is a wrong-headed policy. It would damage this economy by the billions, but more particularly, it would damage the efficiency of defense production, which has taken a long time on the C-17 and other major projects uh, to be developed. And now that it's efficient, this kind of nonsense of pulling C-17 inspectors and other defense production inspectors, uh, I think, uh, needs a very careful review by this committee. And, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enclose at this point in my remarks a uh, statement I've made that uh, raises some fuller questions. But I do hope, whether I'm in the room or not, that you and your colleagues will ask, did the White House directly or indirectly urge any particular closures? Because another series of closures that irks me deeply is the fact that park rangers are pulled from various national monuments. Uh, when people have saved money for five to ten years to finally see those national monuments and they're unable to do it, not to mention, of course, the Social Security field offices and all the other things we all know about. So I'd like to I thank the gentleman, you. and uh, without objection, the, uh, the uh, statement will be made part of the record. Also, a uh, uh, statement from Mr. Bass, uh, without objection, will uh, be made part of the record. I also have a statement and a request from uh, Cardis Collins, the ranking member of the full committee. And without objection, uh, her statement will be made part of the record. Um, I've also had requests, I might say, from several, uh, well, a number of members now. It's growing uh, to uh, testify and comment on, on the, the question of the impact of the shutdown and how we proceed. Uh, <coughs> And uh, we are going to hold a members panel next Tuesday at 1.30 and give all of the members who wish an opportunity to be heard at that time. If any members do have an, uh, a statement they'd like to be made as a part of the record today, we'll also be glad to include that in the text uh, in order to be fair to everyone. I think we'll proceed in that fashion. I'd like to now call our first uh, panel uh, and uh, we have them before us, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Walter Brodnax, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Dwight Robinson, Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Thomas uh, Glenn, Department of Labor, George uh, uh, Munez, uh, the uh, Department of Treasury, uh, Eugene Brickhouse, uh, Department of Veterans <laughs> Affairs, and uh, Shirley uh, uh, Chater, uh, the, uh, the Commissioner of the Social Securities Administration. As uh, some of you have appeared before us before, some of you are no new members, this is an Investigations and Oversight uh, Subcommittee and a Committee of Congress. So if you would please stand, I'd like to administer an oath. <coughs> if you'd raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this Subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The uh, witnesses have answered in the affirmative. <coughs> Again, I'd like to welcome our uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, since we have several uh, uh, 
lengthy panels here. We are going to uh, use a five-minute uh, rule. Uh, you uh, are asked if you have a lengthy uh, detailed statement to uh, submit it for the record, and it will be made part of uh, the record. And we'd appreciate your summarizing so that the, uh, uh, the members of uh, the subcommittee will have an opportunity to uh, uh, discuss and ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, we'll start uh, first, if we may, uh, by uh, having a statement by uh, Dr. Walter Broadnax, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, welcome, and uh, you are recognized, sir. Thank you, Chairman Micah, and members of the, of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today concerning the Department of Health and Human Services um, implementation of the recent government shutdown. Mr. Chairman, this is my oral statement. I have sub submitted my full testimony for the record. The first casualty of a shutdown is the morale of our employees who were incorrectly termed non-essential. I want to make the point clearly that all HHS employees are essential. During a lapse in appropriations, some employees may continue to work as a matter of law. Others may not, a distinction made by law, not by the value of their work. The HHS shutdown plan was developed and implemented in accordance with existing laws and guidelines contained in the legal opinions developed by the Department of Justice and OMB guidelines. Consequently, HHS determined that 33,600 or 55 percent of our employees would continue to work during the shutdown because their work was accepted. HHS had to furlough approximately 27,500 or 45 percent because their work was not classified in one of the accepted categories. The Secretary and the Deputy Secretary kept HHS employees advised of key developments regarding a possible shutdown. The Secretary met personally with the heads of HHS operating divisions prior to the shutdown and assured them that she considered each and every one of our employees and the services that they provide to be essential. However, it was made clear to, clear to them that normal <coughs> business would have to be suspended for the duration of the shutdown consistent with legal requirements. I am proud of the efforts made by our shutdown team who prepared a shutdown plan and managed that plan once OMB officially announced the shutdown. Their efforts enabled HHS to proceed in an orderly manner to implement the shutdown. The team met frequently before and during the shutdown and provided a vital focal point for information and guidance about the shutdown. It was necessary for the team to consider adjustments to the shutdown plan after initial implementation since circumstances changed as the shutdown continued. For example, following the President's announcement that new Medicare beneficiaries should be enrolled during the shutdown, HHS identified employees of the Healthcare Financing Administration, HICFA, who provided these services and prepared to call them back to work. What about the costs of shutdown? They are extremely difficult to determine. Besides employee morale, we know that roughly $5 million a day was lost due to HHS wages and rent. But there were significant non-personnel costs to the shutdown as well. Each day we had to turn away 10,000 new Medicare applicants. New patients could not be accepted into clinical research at the NIH Clinical Center. An average of 170 patients enter each week. The Centers for Disease Control ceased disease surveillance. Therefore, information about the spread of disease such as the flu and AIDS was unavailable. The shutdown gave a holiday to deadbeat dads since we had to shut down the parent locator service to which is referred on average 15 to 20,000 cases per day. Hotline calls to the NIH concerning diseases could not be answered and calls to our Inspector General concerning fraud and abuse could not be referred. Fortunately, the effects of the shutdown did not have an impact on some of our customers. For example, the Medicaid and Aid to Families with Dependent Children programs were already funded for the first quarter prior to shutdown from advance appropriations and Medicare claims were paid from trust funds which were not affected by the shutdown. But these Medicare claims were paid by contractors who could not be paid during the shutdown 
and who, who would have to cease Medicare payments if their cash ran out due to a longer hiatus. The impact of another shutdown on December 15th would be substantially worse. We would have all the same problems that we encountered in November, but we would add to them the lack of available funding for Medicaid, AFDC, and foster care, and all the other programs that are due to be funded for the second quarter on January 1st, 1996. These grants are prepared and then awarded on January 1st. This affects approximately 4,500 grant awards totaling more than $28 billion. Clearly, shutdown of the government is in no one's interest. The public is left without services that affect the most vulnerable among us. States are left to support a myriad of services that they cannot afford alone. Contractors providing accepted services such as Medicare claims payment are left in the position of either floating the government through the crisis or suspending payments. And employees are told they cannot come to work and do their jobs providing services tracking diseases and caring for the elderly in the people's department simply because their jobs their job does not meet the legal definition of an accepted function i am sure you will agree that these costs are simply too high for the country to to bear and therefore we must do all within our power to avoid another shutdown thank you mr chairman and i would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Broadnax. Uh, we are going to withhold questions till we finish uh, the panel. Uh, I'd like to recognize now uh, Mr. Uh, Dwight uh, Robinson, who's acting Deputy Secretary <coughs> of the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the planning, implementation, and oversight of the recent shutdown of the government including the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We believe that our actions followed the law, directions from ONB, the Department of Justice, and what was necessary under the regrettable circumstances. We are pleased to be able to answer your questions and to discuss with you, uh, your, uh, discuss with your committee how we thought through the process and how the plan unfolded. Like most federal agencies, HUD had experienced short-term shutdowns before, although the most recent lasted just a half a day in 1990. In compliance with a series, series of OMB bulletins issued over the last 15 years, we had in place general guidance and procedures for implementing a shutdown. That possibility grew stronger late in the summer, and in August and early September, the Department undertook a thorough legal review of opinions from the Department of Justice, and we also examined OM, uh, OPM instructions and OMB guidance to update and add detail to our plan for operations during a funding lapse. The plan was submitted and reviewed by OMB in September. The plan is conceptual rather than administrative, it reviews each of the programs for which the Department is responsible in terms of its legal authority to continue activities under the applicable statutes. What we found was that the length of the funding hiatus really determines the work that can be done. In a one or two day lapse in funding, we would require only minimal emergency staff to protect life and property and provide for an orderly shutdown of activities but a longer shutdown would require more HUD staff to perform activities necessary to protect life and property. In October, we developed a contingency plan containing the administrative procedures and personnel guidance for implementing a shutdown. Employees were told of the possibility of a shutdown and advised of their personnel rights and told how a furlough would affect benefits and employment. Employees over the two-week period were provided with materials. As we neared the critical date, assistant secretaries and program managers were asked to provide specific plans for short-term shutdown, keeping only those few employees who would be protecting life and properties or conducting the shutdown itself. On Monday before the shutdown, November 13th, uh, through a headquarters public address uh, system and a national conference call, the secretary addressed all HUD staff, explaining the impending funding problems and the possibility of a furlough. The shutdown began on the morning of uh, 
Tuesday, November 14th, uh, OMB provided the official notice that employees should be released. And those employees who were accepted per the plan were provided with a letter containing the emergency conditions under which they were uh, retained. And all other employees were provided with a furlough le letter and other personnel guidance. Once again, the Secretary informed employees by conference call, facsimile transmission, and over the public address system in headquarters that, uh, of the shutdown. And the shutdown was executed orderly. About 400 HUD employees were accepted during this period, and about 11,000 were furloughed. Consistent with our long-term plans, during the week we determined that we would need to bring more employees back uh, and furlough uh, bring back on board additional furloughed employees if the funding lapse continued beyond a week or so. For example, HUD provides operating subsidies and modernization funds to 3,400 local housing agencies, who in turn provide public housing and services to 1.4 million low-income households. These funds are drawn down by public housing authorities on a daily basis as needed. Additional HUD public housing employees would have been needed to provide these funds of about $25 million per day. On Thursday, November 16th, no, no, discussions were held on providing additional staff with OMB. And by the weekend, we had a plan to increase emergency staff to meet critical needs in, uh, in public business. As it happens, the crisis was over before this uh, next step took place. We have found that planning for contingencies is not a static process when planning for an event that is unknown. Longer shutdowns require a continuous assessment of staffing in order to gauge when the absence of providing some government function would cause impending threat to life and property. We believe that our planning process worked the way it should have worked, within the law and the regulations, and with enough flexibility to adjust to circumstances. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss these matters. We provide material to your staff in response to our specific, your specific request for documentation, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, and uh, yield now uh, and recognize to uh, Thomas uh, Glenn, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate this opportunity to appear before the committee this morning to discuss the uh, planning and implementation of the shutdown plans at the Labor Department. And I, too, am going to summarize my statement, which will be submitted for the record. I thought it might be useful to just spend a minute on the historical perspective of the Department on the question of shutdowns. Um, the Department of Labor has developed shutdown plans regularly for more than a decade. Since 1985, only in two years, FY89 and FY95, did we have an appropriation on October 1st. Therefore, in 10 out of the 12 uh, most recent years, we have had to prepare for the possibility of a shutdown. Some years we've had a continuing resolution on October 1st, and other years we haven't. This is probably particularly related to the, uh, the history of the labor HHS education appropriation and sometimes the difficulties it has had getting through both houses. The basis for the Department of Labor plan as it has been revised on an almost annual basis goes back to the guidance from OMB in 1980, revised by Director Stockman in 1982, and the memo from Attorney General Civiletti in 1981. The Department of Labor's plan is actually published as a document entitled Continuing Resolution on Suspension of the Operating Procedures of the Department. This document delineates the steps necessary to complete an orderly shutdown. It requires each unit to develop a plan, and it requires each plan to have a listing of accepted employees in several categories. One, those who are in the category of protecting an imminent threat to life and property, two, those in the category who manage mandatory benefit programs, three, those whose funding is not subject to annual appropriation, and fourth, the support staff necessary to perform the above three functions. In addition, each unit is responsible for developing 
a list of employees essential to shut down the department on a temporary basis. In an effort to just touch on the questions which we were asked to address this morning, I would say in terms of the process followed at the department, we began with our published plan as it has developed over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, conducted an August review, received the memo from OMB in late August and communicated to our agencies the need to develop plans by early September. They were transmitted to OMB in late September. A number of questions were raised by OMB and changes were made so that we had a final plan by the middle of November, which um, proposed 3,000 accepted employees and 470 essential employees. On the question of the control agency guidance, I think we received approximately 10 communications from OMB, OPM, and the Justice Department between August 1st and mid-November. Um, and I think that uh, the, uh, speaking for the Department of Labor, we found the OMB to be cooperative and responsive to our questions without trying to micromanage every decision that needed to be made at the Department of Labor. On the question of oversight, all the plans and modifications were reviewed by our solicitor's office, our budget office, and by OMB for the policy questions that they would raise. The information that we disseminated to our employees was similar to what you have heard from the Department of HHS and HUD. The costs to the Department of Labor we calculated at about $7.3 million in payroll costs for employees who did not work during that period. Um, Mr. Chairman, that summarizes the Department of Labor shutdown plan and implementation. I, I thank you for the chance to appear, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or submit any further documentation that the committee might require. Thank you, and uh, now recognize uh, George Munoz, uh, Assistant Secretary for Management and Chief Financial Officer of the Department of Treasury. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Secretary Rubin to testify on the Treasury Department's plans for and implementations of the recent partial shutdown of the federal government between November 14th and November 19th, 1995. I too will submit the f my formal presentation for the record and will just want to highlight portions thereof. From the beginning, Treasury has approached this issue in a very methodical manner. Our process was managed taking into account the interest of the American public and Treasury employees within the legal parameters. This is not a matter that any of us looked forward to, but given that it was necessary, we made it run as smoothly as possible. To understand the impact of the shutdown, it's important to keep in mind that Treasury Department has 11 bureaus, all of which serve an important role in the overall government's responsibilities, with functions that are broad and critical to the nation's well-being. One of the concerns that we identified in planning for the shutdown was the unfortunate misuse of the terms essential and unessential. We very much agree with the statements earlier made by Representative Morella on this matter. This terminology was not used in any of our shutdown plans. I know that I speak on behalf of the Secretary when I say that these are inappropriate terms that mistakenly convey a sense of relative importance among federal employees. They perpetuate the false impression that some federal workers perform jobs that are trivial or unnecessary. Every day, federal workers provide valuable service for the American taxpayer. Instead, our determinations of the work that can and cannot continue in the absence of appropriations are based on the Anti-Deficiency Act's requirements and not on the basis of some abstract, abstract judgment of workers' value. Our, in August, we put together a review team that examined all of the plans from our bureaus to ensure that those plans were consistent with the applicable legal principles that were well thought out and clearly communicated. The Treasury Department performed well only because in this review team we had representatives starting at the top with Secretary Rubin, myself, members of the CFO department, members of the general counsel under Ed Knight, our personnel office and our general managers. It was due to this review team that we were able to review our, our bureau's plans and give guidance to them so that they would be complete and well communicated to all employees. 
Once the shutdown was ordered by OMB, we used the network of Bureau shutdown coordinators, which we had established, and the Bureau heads to instruct them to begin implementation of their shutdown plans. The Bureaus and the Department began issuing furlough notices and ordered non-accepted employees to begin to shut down their operations and go home once that process was completed. We established a hotline and we put it into effect on the day of the shutdown with the purpose of informing all Treasury employees of the status of the shutdown. This hotline proved effective and permitted questions to be answered. During the shutdown, our departmental review team continued to meet to evaluate exception requests that became necessary as circumstances changed. Through conference calls initiated twice daily between the department review team and the shutdown coordinators in the bureaus, we provided continuous communications to the twice daily between the department review team and the shutdown coordinators in the bureaus. We provided continuous communications to the bureaus on the status of, of appropriations action as well as answering operational questions. We also used this team to ensure that departmental operations were back to normal as soon as possible after the Treasury Department shutdown was ended. In general, the system that was put in place worked extremely well and facilitated rapid and coordinated communications with Treasury's 154,000 employees, easing to the extent possible the negative effects on morale and minimizing the negative impacts on the shutdown on productivity. Mr. Chairman, you have provided the Secretary with a list of questions to be answered and the Department's written answers to these questions address in more detail our management of the process. We will be providing these answers for the record. We hope that you will find them complete. Please have your staff get back to us if there are any further extensions on those answers. This concludes my <coughs> oral remarks. I thank you and I recognize Eugene A. Brickhouse, Assistant Secretary for Human Resources and Administration in the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the subcommittee's interest in how executive branch agencies plan for and implemented the recent government shutdown. And we'll be pleased to share with you our experiences in the Department of Veterans Affairs. With your permission, I will provide a brief summary of my written statement, and then I will be glad to respond to any questions. VA started planning for a potential lapse of appropriations in early August. We had the benefit of previous guidance from OMB and the Justice Department. Also, OPM issued extensive questions and answers regarding furloughs, which were very helpful. Current OMB and Justice Department guidelines were received well before the end of the month and provided further assistance to us in our planning efforts. As you are aware, the VA is a large department with multiple missions, including health care for veterans, delivery of compensation, education, and other benefits, and operation of the National Cemetery System. Because of this diversity, we ask each of our operating components to develop a shutdown plans appropriate to their individual programs. <coughs> These were independently reviewed by our general counsel to ensure that legal requirements were met and were then incorporated in our VA level plan. The plan was ready for implementation when needed on November the 14th and was put into effect by operating VA managers and supervisors. The plan called for a continuation of direct medical care to veterans as well as other activities which are in the accepted category. This included police and security services, benefit determinations for accepted functions, receipt and processing of payments, management of government property, and interments in our national cemeteries. VA had some activities which were not dependent on appropriated funds, and these were allowed to continue. This included operations of the Veterans Canteen Service, certain medical research activities, operation of the VA supply system, and medical care cost recovery system for the third-party insurers. At the close of the shutdown, <coughs> period, approximately 206,000 employees had been designated as accepted and another 33,000 were in furlough status. Clearly, the impact of the shutdown was felt by the veterans and family members whose calls went unanswered, whose appointments were canceled, whose claims for benefits or grade markers were delayed, and although direct patient care continued, our medical facilities felt the strain of suppliers and contractors who were reluctant to proceed with orders when there was no funding to back them up. I think all of us hope earnestly that another shutdown would not be necessary. With regard to VA's plan, we believe that it met the requirements of the law while making use of every possible opportunity to continue, to continue service to veterans. I would like to close with a word of praise for VA managers, supervisors, and, and employees. They implemented the shutdown, unwelcome as it was, in an orderly, responsible fashion, and we can be proud of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I will be 
glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Brickhouse, and would like to recognize now Shirley Chater, Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My written uh, testimony has been presented to you for the record. But with my time this morning, I'd like to answer some of the questions about the number of Social Security Administration employees who were furloughed. I'd like to tell you about the services that were maintained during the shutdown and the services, of course, that were interrupted. On November 14th, the Social Security Administration furloughed about 61,000 non-accepted employees and retained about 4,800 accepted employees. Now, the vast majority of those employees who remained on the job were directly involved in the processes involved in paying benefits to currently enrolled Social Security, Supplemental Security Income, and Black Lung beneficiaries. We also retained some employees who maintain records for those beneficiaries currently on the rolls. In addition, uh, Social Security continued to perform functions related, of course, to the protection of life and property and all of the administrative activities necessary to support the accepted functions. I want you to know, however, that none of our district Social Security offices were closed. Now, let me tell you about uh, the suspensions. There were a number of agency functions that we suspended during the shutdown. I want to make it clear to you that Social Security never used the term non-essential to describe either the services that were disrupted during the shutdown period or the employees who provide those services. Although the functions that were suspended did not at that time meet the definition of accepted activities under the statute, they are critical to the mission of Social Security, and we feel very strongly about that. Now, if I can tell you about the work that was not done, I need to paint a context for you so that you understand how far behind we are. The Social Security Administration receives, on average, about 28,000 retirement and disability benefit applications every single day. We receive an average of about 53,000 applications for Social Security numbers every day. And every day, we answer about 200,000 telephone calls on our 800 number. Every day, we conduct approximately 2,700 hearings for claimants who appeal the denial of benefits. While Social Security during the shutdown did not process new benefits of Social Security numbers, we did not, uh, we provided only an automated message on the 800 number, so we were not available to answer questions. And of course, there were no hearings conducted during this four-day period. These numbers make it very clear that an appropriation lapse has a severe impact on Social Security's ongoing ability to properly administer our Social Security programs. If several days elapse in which no benefit applications are handled and no hearings are conducted, it could seriously impair the agency's capacity to process pending claims and appeals. Because of our deep concern about the potential impact on service to the public, we were prepared to make appropriate adjustments in our initial SSA's shutdown plan if we uh, su suspected a prolonged in appropriations. And the President asked SSA to review its shutdown plan in light of the potential length of the shutdown. We were ready to act. We were ready to accept and process new claims applications. And I decided at that point, should it come, I would expand the number of accepted employees effective November 20th and bring back 50,000 people especially to our field offices and to the telephone centers. On the other hand, those not directly involved in paying benefits or accepting and processing claims would have remained on furlough. Because all federal employees returned to work on November 20th, I did not have to take this action. In closing, I can say with confidence that Social Security implemented the shutdown in an orderly manner. 
and in full compliance with the applicable statutes and directives and guidance from the Office of Management and Budget and others, which government-wide responsibility for ensuring the consistency of individual agency shutdown plans. I would be happy to answer your questions. I thank uh, you and each of the uh, panelists uh, for your testimony uh, this morning and for the uh, comprehensive uh, coverage each of you provided the uh, subcommittee with uh, how you approach this uh, question of a shutdown. Um, I'd like to begin some of the questioning by um, asking if, um, in fact, let's see, we have um, several different plans for shutdown. I have an HHS plan here, which I guess is basically a two-page plan. Maybe there's more to this. And you have 60,000 employees, and I believe 27,000 were deemed uh, essential. And then I have the other, another plan here, which is a little bit thicker, Department of Labor. And this one is uh, 184 pages. You have a total of 16,000 employees, of which uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of several hundred were deemed uh, essential uh, and uh, retained. It seems to be sort of a wide disparity. Uh, maybe I could ask uh, HHS, is this your full uh, plan? Or uh, do you have uh, uh, something additional? Mr. Chairman, I, the document that you're holding, the two-page document, uh, really acts more as a summary. Uh, the detailed plan behind that summary is approximately 30 pages. It still does not come to the 184 the pages that the Department of Labor has. I would go on to say that, it, that, uh, that uh, in this particular case, I think the difference is probably in the details in terms of the the difference in the two, two uh, roles and functions, at least at some level, that the two departments play. Well, the other uh, question I have for both of you, I, now, you know, the shutdown doesn't appear to be any new idea. Uh, I think we had testimony from uh, both Mr. Uh, uh, Gwynn and uh, maybe Mr. Uh, Munoz uh, also spoke to it that shutdowns are not new. I think. And, 10 of 12 years, uh, we, uh, uh, we didn't have an appropriations measures. But I have a, uh, a memo dated July 26th. It uh, doesn't say anything about uh, whether the speaker gets to speak with the president on the plane or not. Um, but uh, in fact, it, it uh, isn't by Alice Rivlin. And it uh, says, planning in light of appropriations actions, very clear directing you all on the 26th to come up with plans. It says we recognize that, uh, uh, that uh, there may be delayed or uh, reflects sharp disagreement with the President's uh, request and that uh, there may, in fact, may not be funding. I think, did each of you see this? Uh, each of you receive this. Uh, it's my understanding, too, that you were to respond by September 5th. Is that correct? Uh, did everyone here respond? Uh, I'm getting a f affirmative uh, head uh, <coughs> shakes. Uh, uh, so it wasn't anything, first of all, new, and secondly, that there were some uh, uh, there were some very uh, direct uh, uh, actions by the administration to plan for the the shutdown. Uh, my question is, uh, w do you feel this is adequate? I don't see. Uh, a great deal of distinguishing between what is essential and non-essential, either functions or employees. And I see a great disparity between the plans that have been developed. Uh, and, and I'd like you to respond. Maybe, Mr. Broadnax, uh, you could respond, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Gwynn uh, and, and the others feel free to comment. Um, it's sort of back to where we um, stopped with the comparison between the two plans, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you look at um, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, what we did was to apply the, the guidelines as, as outlined uh, by the law and the OMB guidelines that were issued and applied that to the work of the department from the bottom to the top. Um, and after applying the, the, the law and the guidelines with the guidance of uh, uh, OMB uh, in that process, uh, we then came out with a number of people that we felt that we could furlough in the first instance. 
uh, and the number that would be required or are accepted, uh, as it were, to carry on the work of the department in the first instance. <coughs> But understanding, as outlined in our plan, that, that this was an evolving process. Uh, so uh, the number we began with uh, uh, might change after a period of time, depending on the length uh, of the shutdown. Mr. Glenn, how do you see this? Well, as is I this, indicated, is this the adequate? Uh, do you see these uh, guidelines as adequate? Uh, uh, and you prepared a more comprehensive response. Well, as I, as I indicated and as you mentioned, the, uh, the Department of Labor, along with several other agencies in our Appropriations Subcommittee, has had numerous uh, opportunities over the last 10 or 15 years to prepare shutdown plans because of the difficulty of getting our appropriation approved by October 1. So that uh, we found the guidance issued by OMB adequate. I think perhaps uh, it would be fair to say that over the years, a certain amount of boilerplate has been developed in terms of how the shutdown plans have been developed by our department and reviewed by OMB. We chose to submit to OMB a full uh, plan with all the boilerplate attached. I, it sounds like at HHS they recognize that perhaps OMB had a certain amount of this because it's been done over the years. So uh, I'm not sure that there's as much difference in terms of the two documents as it might appear at first blush. Well, uh, the other question I had is some of the, uh, the uh, rationale for closing down uh, certain functions and then some of the statistics that have been quoted. I think, Mr. Broadnax, did you say that were, there were 1,500 or 15,000 deadbeat dad uh, requests a day? 15 to 20,000 per day. Per day. That would be 3 million a year? This is through the referral service. Three million a year. Well, these are calls about calls coming in. So you could have, uh, you know, a call every day about the same person, presumably. But that's the number of calls coming in. And uh, let me, if I may, go back to the, uh, to, uh, or go to the VA uh, uh, administration here. Uh, Mr. Brickhouse. Uh, there seem to be some changes in what was essential and non-essential as far as uh, what the administration considered uh, uh, essential on one day versus another day. I, I believe the President decided to call back uh, 1,700 uh, VA field staff uh, and uh, change uh, this, uh, I think, after your initial determination. Did you have direction from the administration to make these changes, or did you initiate? Did you help initiate this? Mr. <coughs> Chairman, when we developed our plan that was submitted to OMB at the start of the shutdown, uh, we outlined the numbers that we thought were appropriate. However, in that planning, uh, we planned for a shutdown perhaps in the neighborhood of a three to four day at maximum. And what happened on the, the last Friday of the shutdown plan, when we began to look at our activities, uh, we recognize that perhaps if this shutdown was going to go into the following Monday of the next week, that we felt it appropriate to identify and bring some additional people in. So you initiated that request rather than vice versa. The pres it was a request to the administration, the president. We initiated the request, yes. And did any of you other request changes uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, essential and non-essential? You did, Mr. Uh, Robinson? Yes, sir, we did. Yes. And w what was that? Well, similar to uh, the VA, we uh, reviewed our uh, shutdown plans, which, uh, as indicated, have been longstanding across the government uh, in, in light of the guidance that we received from, from OMB. Uh, and we submitted a plan that uh, uh, indicated the, uh, a certain nature of flexibility because based on the experience of the government, a short shutdown uh, had been the experience that uh, our agency had been through, the government had been through. So our plan called for us to review based on the length of the shutdown, and we had initiated discussions uh, during the week uh, of the shutdown with OMB, uh, petitioning them to uh, uh, modify our plan. Uh, since the last shutdown, now let's see, we have uh, Defense and Treasury po Postal has been passed. We have seven appropriations bills in place. 
Uh, have there been any additional requests from either OMB or from the administration to redefine uh, what is essential or non-essential? If we get into a second shutdown, uh, has there been any request uh, to, uh, to, re uh, to redefine uh, the terms? Any of you aware of anything? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would say OMB has asked us to review the success and the lessons from the first shutdown and make any <coughs> appropriate and amendments to the plan, which doesn't speak directly to the question. Did you have a deadline for submitting that? Is that? Uh, uh, I think it's due a week from tomorrow. A little close. <laughs> but uh, I guess we're, we're looking at December 15th as the next possible day. So a week from tomorrow, next Thursday? Yeah, I have the, actually, I have the, the memo with me if you want to wait one second. <clears throat> I think it's important that we, we find out what steps are being taken to see uh, what, again, what services should be continued, uh, what uh, functions should be continued, uh, personnel, and how these matters should be handled. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it is due to uh, OMB on December 10th. De December 10th, mm -hmm. uh, next, would that be next week, I guess, Sunday? Monday. All right. Well, uh, I don't. I've, I've got some additional questions, but I don't want to occupy all the time. I want to yield now to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Chairman Micah. The thing that I found most troubling and disappointing about the uh, way in which the executive branch reacted to the shutdown was the bizarre situation you created on the first day of the shutdown with everyone coming into work and then going, being told whether or not they were essential and being <coughs> sent back home again. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that was inexcusable. In fact, we knew by the end of the prior week whether or not people would be coming, should be coming into work. It seems to me when there was clear indication and plans being put together in the late summer of this year, in July and August, that we may very well uh, reach a situation that um, could cause a, a government shutdown. And clearly, that very short-term continuing resolution that was passed as of October 1st indicated we had a potential problem coming at the expiration of the first continuing resolution. There should have been contingency plans made for the first day uh, when you would have lapsed appropriations. And it appears that there were not. I just can't imagine why you would create a situation where employees came in and were told to go back home again. It's demeaning. It's, uh, uh, it's amateurish. It's uh, irresponsible, et cetera. Um, now, if you disagree, tell me. But I would like to know uh, how that situation developed at some of the larger agencies and why. Why there were not contingency plans made by OMB and the White House and, and made available to the agencies. Um, and uh, if there were, why? they were not uh, carried out. So let's start with Dr. Brodnax from the, you are the largest uh, agency, I guess, re re uh, represented here in terms of employees, a substantial number of whom came in that first day on Monday and were sent back home again. Why? Um, um, uh, Congressman, uh, there are roles for uh, people to play during that, that three-hour period that you're talking about when people came back in. And people secured the various areas depending on uh, the work that they were carrying out during that three-hour period. Uh, so people weren't just called back in and sort of standing around uh, uh, wringing their hands, as it were, uh, but were actually working uh, to secure the areas uh, where machinery was involved to secure machinery. Uh, and make other arrangements to get us into the full shutdown. So the full shutdown began three hours subsequent to those employees having arrived, carried out their tasks and duties, and then were sent home. 
So what you're telling me is for the first three hours of the day, their services were considered essential, even though there was no uh, reimbursement for that effort available at the time. Uh, see, the, the problem is if we're going to operate within a strict legal construct here, uh, the only way you can justify any, member, any members of the federal workforce going to work is to consider them essential. And we've got a definition of essential, uh, the uh, safety of human life and protection of property, I guess. The latter is probably what you used. But you would have to have some type of legal opinion to get around the Anti-Deficiency Act that these people were at some point essential. In other words, 100 percent of your employees, you would have to legally justify were essential at the time for those three hours. And then all of a sudden, they're not essential. Uh, I don't know why that wasn't done the end of the work week, rather than waiting until not the 11th hour or the 12th hour, but 1205 <laughs> after the expiration period. Could I, could I help yeah, respond I'd to like this? Yeah, I'd like for you to, Mr. Munoz. Sir, uh, let me just say that I, I think OMB did an excellent job of having a contingency plan because we were on hold. We were informed by OMB, by Alice Rivlin in particular, that uh, we were to not notify anyone of a shutdown until we received notice. And that could have been on Monday, we were told. So be on hold for a possible Monday notification or not until Tuesday. Now, I don't know what went into the thinking as to whether or not to not do it on Monday so that people don't have to come back on Tuesday. But as I understand it, uh, OMB very much respected the prerogative of Congress to decide whether or not after midnight, Monday night, um, there was going to be, before midnight, there was going to be anything. And a perfect example of that was, in fact, when the shutdown uh, was terminated, as we understand, in a very, in a period of a very few hours, settlement was arrived at between the President and the Congress on the, on the terminating the shutdown. I believe that was what was the thinking. Second of all, we do need uh, certain, there are certain legal procedures that need to take place when you get into an orderly shutdown. Coming back Tuesday morning was very uh, positive for the Treasury Department. And I may add that the legal authority that, that defines accepted and unaccepted also says that you can maintain people for an orderly shutdown. So we read that legally based on our general counsel's opinion that for the whole morning on, the, on Tuesday, the hours that it took for people to close down the files and make sure that there's uh, no risk or exposures from, from their retiring from work uh, was left exposed. And secondly, we have a legal obligation to give furlough notices in writing and have some indication of receipt of notice. All that was taken on after we knew that the Congress and the President decided, or I'm sorry, decided not to agree that uh, there was going to be some funding. Um, so we think that that was probably the best way to approach it, and we felt very comfortable. Uh, by Tuesday afternoon, uh, everybody, it was a good, clear communication as to who was going to stay and who wasn't. At the Treasury Department, for example, sir, we have some functions that are funded because they have a revolving fund or, or, or have other means of appropriations that uh, would not be subject to this furlough. Nonetheless, the media, because of the media communication, sometimes that may confuse employees as to what is overwritten and what isn't. And we made it very clear on Tuesday morning, we made very effective use of Tuesday morning to hand out the furlough notices and to make further uh, communications to the employees. I, you just did an excellent job of defending OMB and clarifying the situation. Uh, but um, there are some problems with that. For one, uh, we had a different situation on the Sunday when we terminated the termination, the shutdown. Uh, it, and um, uh, that, that was not comparable to what happened on Monday. Presumably, the White House knew whether or not it was going to veto the continuing resolution it received. And it certainly knew what the continuing resolution was going to look like. Now, I'm not going to ask you that. That's uh, OMB's job to explain why they, uh, they didn't act or why the, um, uh, the, the, the President didn't uh, give some earlier indication. I, uh, uh, but I think it's a different situation that occurred on that on the Sunday when the government shutdown ended. Uh, but uh, I have the sense that some employees, even on Monday, 
knowing that, that anybody that had been watching it closely uh, would have known that there was not going to be work on Tuesday for at least 40 percent of the workforce. Some of them did not know whether they were essential or non-essential. Now, uh, did, uh, did everyone in your respective agencies know whether they were classified essential or non-essential on Monday? Uh, is there anyone who did? Every, every agency represented here uh, informed their employees as to whether they made the cut or not. That's true. I, uh, yeah. Is there any exception? <coughs> If not, forever hold your peace, I suppose. Uh, you want to say something further? Sir, the only, the only, the, the clearest indication to an employee is, is when, in fact, they receive the furlough notice. That's, that's the, the ultimate and clearest. You don't want to wait until that instant that's happens. Sure. And we did have communications beforehand so that there be some clear communications on that. But uh, according to law, and, and, and for all practical purposes, especially when you have a very large agency spread around the country, uh, the clearest indication was that Tuesday morning. It was an effective use of that Tuesday morning to, c right. to give the written notice and further instructions of, of how to shut down their office. Well, it's just that since it was so likely uh, uh, by the end of the prior week, it seemed to me that planning should have taken place certainly by that Friday through the weekend and no, no question about it on Monday. Uh, and the other thing I want to get into, although I don't want to uh, take time from my colleagues, so, uh, but uh, I think an important area of consideration is whether those employees who had to stay at work, getting reimbursed the same as their colleagues who were not at work, uh, whether there was ample communication so that those who were on the job knew how to carry out not just their own function but the, the necessary functions of their colleagues. Uh, that's the kind of forward planning that seemed to be necessary. I, I have a lot of federal employees, as you know, on my desk. I don't have a sense that much of that took place, that it was almost a shock to the vast majority of federal employees that this happened. They were really unprepared. And a lot of the people who were left on the job didn't know how to handle the responsibilities of their colleagues who were not on the job. So I, I think there are problems. The best way to deal with this is to simply make sure everybody stays on the job next time. We don't have one of these inane uh, furloughs. Uh, and, uh, and if people are going to get reimbursed, which they certainly should, uh, then they be reimbursed for work that they performed in the interim. And we're going to try to get that legislation through. But I do think there are some problems in the forward planning of uh, this, uh, this situation, which uh, at some point in advance of when it occurred, uh, was inevitable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman and yield now to Mr. Bass. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And to follow on the very last comment that Mr. Moran made, it, I think it can be uh, observed that the issue of, of giving an employee compensation for time not served on the job further exacerbated the humility of being termed deemed non-essential than not going to work, than getting paid for not going to work. But my question is a general question that any of you can address if you wish, and that is, do, you, do any of you have any specific suggestions for congressional action that might clarify for you the definition of essential versus non-essential, or even redefine the, the term, to establish better procedures for implementing a shutdown, which may in some instances be unavoidable, in order to address Mr. Moran's question about what ha happened to the employees at a, during a specific period of time, to establish consistency from one agency to the next so that there aren't different standards adopted in different agencies. And lastly, and perhaps for some of us most importantly, to, us to mitigate, to attempt to mitigate the impact uh, or the political impact of a shutdown so that a shutdown is, cannot to the extent possible, be used for political, um, for, to, to make a political statement. With that, I'll just turn it over to anyone who wishes to, to address those issues. I'd like to address the question, if I might, sir, in the, from the sense that uh, it's, it's probably going to be difficult to be thoroughly consistent across agencies because the nature of our work differs so much. For Social Security, for example, where we are an extremely customer-focused agency, 
we had appointments to take care of, appointments to cancel, and now appointments to make up in a very one-on-one -on -one kind of activity. Uh, our work is therefore different from another agency that perhaps doesn't deal with the public in a face-to-face -face way. So while I think consistency across government is a good idea, I just suggest that it might be difficult based on the work we do and how we do that work. One suggestion I might have is the, the thing that was constantly in our mind at Treasury when we were planning this was the criminal penalties that accompany any running afoul of the uh, Justice Department guidelines on this issue. Given that there are criminal penalties, you really have, uh, you, run it, you run the risk on the one hand that if you read the, uh, if you read the opinions too broadly so that you try to put everything under protection of property, uh, you run the risk of, of running afoul of those criminal penalties. If you read it too narrowly, then you run into some of the examples that were cited earlier this morning in terms of uh, the public being harmed in some fashion because they didn't fall within the guidelines, the, the criminal guidelines. I would How many prosecutions have occurred under that since its inception? Well, I'm sure that they, if there have been any, they have, they're not here today, but uh, <laughs> I'm not aware of it, although as a lawyer I know that uh, these are very serious things and our good general counsel at night at the uh, Treasury Department kept us aware that that's, that's the, the ultimate that we have to live by. Nobody else has any comments. I'll yield back. I thank the uh, gentleman. Yield now to Ms. Morella for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm curious, and, and again, I would ask uh, all or any one of you or uh, multiples of whatever uh, who might want to respond. I'm curious about whether or not your shutdown plan um, would be altered uh, if the shutdown occurred because of the debt ceiling versus the lapse in appropriations. Would it be different or would it be the same? Have you had any, any uh, instructions from um, OMB or Justice on that? We've had no instructions, but those would be two, two very different situations. Um, so you anticipate that it would be a different procedure? No. Um, the shutdown that we went through had a, a constitutional basis uh, based on, on Congress's prerogative to appropriate or not appropriate. And if appropriations right. were right. not granted, then we can really not run afoul of that unless mm -hmm. we face criminal penalties. If the government shuts down for another reason, it, a liquidity point, it doesn't have cash, my sense is, and I don't know that we would ever reach that point, but my my sense is that you don't have the same guidelines, the constitutional basis of appropriations. We may, be, we may have appropriations appropriated to us, but if there's no cash, that it, my, my sense is that thinking would go differently. But to answer your first question, we have not received any guidance on it, but I instantly I, I, I see a, a very different standard by which you would develop your plans. A difference. It, would you all agree, first of all, that you've not received any guidance on it? And, man, can Second, I just underscore then different. the point that you made and, and that we have, some members here have made also? And that's because it isn't, it, because the, guide, the guidelines is not essential versus non-essential. If it were, maybe there would be some great similarity. But it, the guidance is really whether you're accepted under the law or, or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know whether it would be a greater impact or not. I mean, that would be an interesting point also for any one of you to, to comment on. Um, I'd also like to, um, maybe I'll address this one to Mr. Robinson. It deals with the recall question. You indicated that there was a plan in place that acknowledged the need to recall additional staff if the shutdown continued beyond a week. And yet, you had to go to OMB to discuss recalling people. Were these recalls in your initial plan? Uh, were they reviewed by OMB prior to the week of November 13th when OMB came out with its, uh, you know, guidelines? Um, because what, I'm, what I sense you're saying is that OMB uh, approves our plan, and then if we need to implement it, a part of it or need a recall, we have to go back to OMB to get a, another part of it approved? Is this sort of like overkill? What, what I meant to indicate uh, 
Congresswoman, is that uh, our plan originally called for flexibility <laughs> dependent upon circumstances. Uh, is part of our plan that uh, as the circumstance mm -hmm. unfold, we would reassess what uh, needs uh, we would have related to uh, uh, property and safety and, and modify our plan accordingly. As the week proceeded, as I indicated, uh, we determined that, uh, in fact, that was the case and that we needed to modify our plan. In doing so, we had to submit it to OMB, and that was the process that we had undertaken. Do you think that's the, the most expeditious process? Well, uh, I've been in government two years now. It's the only process I'm aware of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to be flipping in my answer, yeah, I, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, there certainly is a tremendous amount of oversight in terms of what we do, not only in terms of our uh, necessity to uh, work with the Office of Management and Budget, but uh, uh, our necessity to work across the board. Uh, and so uh, it's, I think, important that we not only address the law, but we address the uh, uh, requirements of the personnel uh, uh, issues that are involved, and certainly the Office of Management and Budget has the expertise and the responsibility in that area. Um, I Madam, guess could I, could I just yes, add certainly. to my, in the last uh, hypothetical you posed the question of would the plans differ any if, if there were shutdown because of a debt ceiling uh, issue. And uh, as I said, we've received no, no guidance on that, but I want to reemphasize uh, for those agencies that have appropriations already, the, the debt ceiling really is, is not an issue as to whether you would face a shutdown or not a shutdown. It's a question of, of there's still, we still would have authority to obligate the government to pay for the activities that take place. So we don't anticipate the hypothetical that you posed mm -hmm. to be an issue. It, 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 it might be you know, wise to have some kind of a tentative plan that is thought about when you get the uh, OMB regulations with regard to reporting for three hours on that morning, et cetera. That's all spelled out in the, the OMB uh, statement that was made uh, or was sent to all of you. Um, I guess, um, uh, Mr. Brickhouse, um, in regards to the 1,700 employees who are being recalled to receive and um, uh, came up with date benefit claims, you stated that uh, Veterans Affairs determined that the potential for adverse effects of delays in receipt of applications qualified for an exception under the uh, Anti-Deficiency Act. I wondered if you might elaborate on why the Anti-Deficiency Act allowed for this recall and why the determination was not made, made earlier. Um, you began planning in August. Plans were set by September 30th. The shutdown happened in November. And you had to recall 1,700 people. And I'm just kind of mystified by it. Yes, Incidentally, your percentage of furlough was, was I think, the lowest, wasn't it? In, uh, yes. Uh, that's primarily because our primary mission in the VA is to deliver health care. And in those areas, we elected not to defer or delay any treatment in our hospitals that we have, the 172 hospitals that we have across the nation, if you will. But you couldn't anticipate that? In regards to your question, if I understand it correctly, uh, we did not anticipate initially the need for those 1,700 people. As I mentioned earlier, as mm -hmm. we moved through the week and, and saw this shutdown going longer than we had previously anticipated, we decided that it was necessary to bring in people to make sure that they received and logged in claims as a legal requirement that we must date stamp claims that veterans submit to us. So we felt that it was necessary to bring in those people <coughs> to do that and also answer questions and also deal with telephonic inquiries about these matters. We also felt so strongly about this that uh, we asked OMB for permission to, in essence, change our numbers. And you are exactly right. They did come back and tell us that they felt that this was an accepted function under the Anti-Deficiency Act. So to answer your question, no, we did not anticipate it. However, as we moved through the shutdown, we identified some areas of concern in that area, and we... And then you went to OMB. Do you have to go to Justice, too? Uh, I think Justice Department was collaborated on this particular issue, yes. With OMB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, you... Uh, 
determine that as a result of discussions with them? Do you discuss it with them or you just you tell them or? Yeah, it was primarily through telephonic discussions okay. mm -hmm. with OMB. And we submitted a, a written matter on it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. But Thank I might add that we did not find that it was uh, any problem for us to uh, have dialogue with OMB. I think, as, as I recall, uh, that decision was made in a matter of hours, if you will, from the time we submitted the request. I see. I'm just trying to understand the process and the anticipation of what concerns would, would arise and whether or not you've got an extra layer to go through and how well it's planned. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll yield back. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Horn from California. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have basically two questions, and I want to follow up on Mrs. Morella's question, which was an excellent question in terms of a liquidity crisis, cash flow crisis, uh, in, uh, the, with regard to the debt ceiling. Uh, it seems, uh, one, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put a letter in the record that a number of us wrote the President uh, a month ago that said if we're serious about controlling the debt ceiling, we ought to freeze non-essential travel, non-essential purchases, and deal with the not absolutely essential workers. And obviously health care and the VA and others would be absolutely essential workers, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, perhaps that situation has passed. Perhaps it hasn't. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's very clear, Mr. Minos, that a, a debt ceiling shutdown would be a lot more serious, I think, than what we've gone through. Uh, you would not be making up for lost pay. You couldn't afford to do it. Am I wrong on that? Is that your um, hunch or sir, inclination? Yeah, on, on, the, on the hypothetical that was posed, would there be, uh, there's an assumption that, that the debt ceiling would also create a shutdown possibility. The possibility of that is, is very uh, small because that would be a discretionary call. And I'm going to look to my legal counsel here if he wants to correct me. But uh, once we have appropriations in place, we have a responsibility to continue working. If there is a liquidity question, then the question is to whether or not when you're going to get paid, but we still have an obligation to continue working and, and, and there is an obligation of the government to pay. So there wouldn't necessarily have to be a shutdown of government operations. Well, there's something, Mr. Chairman, you might want to consider. It seems to me it is an important question. You ought to give some guidance on that. Let me get to my two basic questions here. And I'd like to ask this of all of you, since you are under oath. Either directly or indirectly, prior, during, or since the shutdown, did any member of the White House staff influence what categories of workers uh, you stated were non-essential or essential? And that includes OMB staff who said, we're getting the word from the White House. Anybody? Let's just get a yes-no answer. No. 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 How about no. you, Mr. Minos? No. 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 And no. And Commissioner Chater. All right. Uh, you're probably the wrong people. We ought to be asking the cabinet officers that. Uh, now, for the hearing record, uh, yeah, for the hearing record, I'd just like to have filed of those on the staffs reporting to those at and above the bureau chief administration, uh, administrator level, institute head level, comparable, level, comparable levels for the categories such as public affairs, management, human resource personnel, general counsel, etc., the traditional staff agencies. I'd like to know, one, how many people are qualified at that level, what percent were determined non-essential and or essential. And of those in direct contact with the customer taxpayer, such as the Social Security Administration and the Immigration Naturalization Service, how many were actually furloughed? And I need an absolute number of how many are there and then what percent was essential, non-essential in terms of direct customer contact. Based on 30 hearings I've held this year on the Government Management Subcommittee, there's no doubt in my mind that since President Eisenhower, regardless of party, we have had a thickening of government, as Professor Light calls it, and uh, we have a bloated staff level at the commissioner, the bureau chief level on up that you would not have recognized 30 years ago. And it does not relate to increased appropriations. It does not relate to a growth in population. It just relates, regardless of party in power, to the bloated nature of staff that, frankly, are crippling you more than helping you. So I'd like to get that in the record, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Horn, did you want to? I just want him to respond by in writing. Okay. We'll put in, it in writing. In okay, writing, yeah. and I we'll put it in the we record. We could spend the rest of the day <laughs> doing the calculations here. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your understanding. Uh, as we wrap up this panel, I have a couple of questions. First of all, um, Ms. let's see, uh, Mr. Glenn, under DOL, you estimated the cost at 7.3. Uh, million dollars, and that was that for personnel alone. Um, I asked that question because each of you incurred cost and you paid people after the fact. I noticed that OPM, Office of Personnel Management, has uh, released a guideline and uh, a guideline as far as the subject pay um, and leave treatment of employees affected by lapse in appropriation, and this. Uh, uh, guideline allows for payment of overtime not work. Now, it's bad enough that they didn't work in the first place but got paid or weren't allowed to work. But uh, I wonder about uh, uh, Mr. Glenn, is, did any, was any of this uh, $7.3 million paid in overtime? Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any, Mr. Chairman, but we'd be happy to double check. And uh, is it, did anyone pay that. overtime? Has anyone paid overtime since, according to these guidelines? That we pay overtime for not working in the time that we didn't work in the first place? Not, no? Not I, I'd like each of you to check that. I think it would be interesting. Also, uh, in, as far as the VA is uh, concerned, Mr. Brickhouse, uh, uh, it's my understanding that you kept on all, first, uh, all field uh, people in the hospitals and there was no differentiation between different types of personnel uh, activities in, the, in that. For example, while you uh, had some claims processors for uh, disabled veterans were not kept on, the gardeners at the ho at VA hospitals were in fact deemed essential. Uh, Congressman Mike, if I may, we did furlough in excess of approximately 20,000 people in our health care delivery system. But uh, I have reports that uh, gardeners and lawn care personnel were kept on and uh, claims processors for disabled vets were, uh, were let off. Of course, they, I guess they were called back. Uh, can you check that for us? Sure. I'd, I'd be glad to. I'd like to know. And then as far as PR shops, uh, did all of you keep your PR shops open or was there a, uh, a uh, decrease uh, in the, the uh, staffing of the, uh, of the public affairs offices? Uh, Mr. Brodnax? Uh, there was a, a, a very, very sharp decrease. There were several people kept to, to help the secretary stay on, uh, in, in touch with the employees throughout the department on a daily basis. So you had some down. How about uh, you, Mr. Robinson? It was a very sharp decrease. I think we... Mr. Glenn? Very significant reduction. Munoz? Significant reduction. Very significant reduction. And the same. Okay. Uh, the other uh, uh, general question, I noticed that there's a there were a variety of plans. For example, uh, in Social Security, you prepared a plan for a two-week shutdown. Uh, were any of you, uh, and it seemed like some of you had a shutdown for a shorter period of time. Was there any continuity? You did two weeks, is that correct? Well, we started uh, in our contingency planning, sir, with the notion that we could have a smaller number of people accepted in the mm -hmm. beginning of the shutdown and not knowing, of course, of course how long it would take. Uh, we made another plan uh, consistent with our objectives for what we might do at a later time. So while the two week was a sort of talking period, mm -hmm. it was never meant to be specifically after 14 days. It so was you, to be so what happened based on our experience. a short term and a longer term. That's what, a better what about term. you, Mr. Brickhouse? In the VA, our initial plan was that this shutdown would not go longer than one week. And as we've talked about, that's why we started making changes. So, so we had some problems there, Mr. Uh, Munoz. We, we looked at short and, and longer term. And longer meant uh, okay. beyond uh, 10 days. Okay. In your volume here, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Glenn, I, wh what, what did you plan for? I haven't read the whole thing. I'm going to take it home tonight and go through it. To <laughs> go ahead. As long as you don't ask me if I've read the whole thing, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> we anticipated a shorter term shutdown when we put the plan together, although we had started thinking about the implications of a longer shutdown as the shutdown so this really is just for short term, but uh, 
Uh, Mr. Robinson. As I testified, short term and longer term, sir. Okay, and Mr. Broadnax. Short your, term and long term. And your two, two page uh, summary, summary. Uh, with a 30 page addendum. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, those are, uh, I think, some of the questions that. Uh, uh, that I had. Well, there's, oh, there's one other area too. In multi-year funding, uh, for example, in HUD, uh, there are some uh, uh, programs I think that have multi-year funding, and some of these I understand were closed down. Uh, what was the rationale for that, uh, and and uh, w where the funds were there that they were closed down anyways? Because you had the biggest close down, didn't you, Mr. Robinson? Uh, I understand that that's the case, sir. Uh, our thinking was that we would uh, uh, apply the law in terms of property and safety, and, and, and we attempted to do that. Funding in many of these multi-year programs is done on, on uh, what we call a lockbox basis. So uh, the recipients have a line of credit against which they draw, draw down funds, and so funds would have flowed over a period of time uh, out of these lockbox situations. So in a short circumstance, we would have been able to cut uh, funding or funding would have been covered through that lockbox process. But you still close them down anyways. Uh, the lockbox process requires us to maintain a number of uh, systems in order to, to do that. Uh, and in our longer term process, we were bringing back people to maintain those systems. Um, I think Mr. Uh, Lazio wants to talk to you later on. Um, the um, other uh, Panelists, did you have any other areas where the continuing, uh, continu there was a continu continuation of funding in a multi-year fashion? It, in our case the, in, of Medicare, it's a trust fund. Um, uh, so, you know, the trust funds were there. Um, mm -hmm. So you kept everything going in Medicare? Well, no, we did not. Uh, that there were, there were, in terms of the applications, uh, taking applications. Initially, we did not, uh, and, and then, it, then you changed. And we thought if we go longer term, we would begin to, okay. to take them. Uh, and for I, Social Security, I would answer the same way. Yes. We have a trust fund, of course, which we interpret as an indefinite mm -hmm. appropriation. And for our second program, the Supplemental Security Income Program, we are forward funded for the first quarter of the year, so we can continue functioning until December 31. So some of the activities that, in fact, have multi-year funding or uh, self-funding, uh, we should possibly look at those categories uh, for uh, future uh, uh, reference and uh, uh, functions to be continued. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, following up on that, uh, I'm, uh, I appreciate the, um, the fact that I'm the only Democrat here, so uh, I want to make an urgent plea that uh, we at least extend the current continuing resolution that is currently in, in effect for at least another month. Uh, the reason for making it at least 30 days uh, deals with uh, several reasons, but I think foremost is um, something that the chairman was getting at, and that is the grant funding. It extends far beyond the, uh, the lives of federal employees. Uh, if, for example, uh, we don't have adequate funding at the beginning of the year, we would not be able to issue the grants for Medicaid, aid for dependent children, social services, foster care, adoption, and so on, that's a matter of billions of dollars and, more importantly, millions of people who are wholly dependent in many cases upon those Medicaid and um, cash assistance grants, the very poorest, the very needy, neediest in our country. Um, it wasn't a problem this time because since it occurred in November, the original a continuing resolution enabled you to pay those grants out to the states on October 1st, the beginning of the, uh, of the fiscal year. The second quarter would be January, uh, would, would occur as of January 1st. And uh, if there is not an adequate continuing resolution, then the lives of tens of millions of people are going to be uh, adversely affected. Uh, 
uh, so I'm, I'm both sending a message to the, uh, my, my colleagues, but also raising an issue that I think perhaps uh, you should address, particularly Dr. Brodnax on, on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services, because those are probably the largest grants that go out to states. I don't know what happens if the ADC payments are not made in Medicaid and uh, Title 20 and foster care and the like. Uh, that could be a disaster shutdown to the people who can afford it the least. Dr. Broadnax, could you respond to that? Well, I, 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 I agree with the Congressman's uh, 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 description. It, it would be very, very painful uh, for the recipients, but also uh, place the states in great difficulties uh, because they are our partners in terms of administering uh, 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 many of the programs that you've described. Uh, and as I said in my, in my um, formal testimony, this is something that we hope to avert at all costs. Thank you. I, the legislation that I referred to that I would hope we could get passed that would keep federal employees on the job in the event of lapsed appropriations does not cover this eventuality because clearly that would not provide adequate funds for your, uh, for your grants. And, uh, and while they may be on the job, in the absence of a uh, continuing resolution, we clearly would have to, t to suspend those payments. Um, and I, I don't see any way we could possibly pass legislation that would get around that. So I, uh, any continue, and I, I have heard various versions of short-term continuing resolutions. They don't share their entire strategy with us all the time. In fact, we don't know oftentimes until the very last minute what the plan is, but I would urge the leadership of this body to, um, uh, to propose an con extended continuing resolution that gets us through uh, early January so that those grants can be made. And at that point, maybe we should move on to the next panel, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I, I think Ms. Morella requested uh, one additional quick Thanks. question. Right. I just wondered, Mr. Brodnack, since I talked about a medical research in my opening statement, if you might uh, tell us about um, what research activities did continue uh, during the shutdown and how the determination was made in terms of what research activities should be continued or not. First of all, Congresswoman, let me say that um, our approach to particularly the, the NIH and the National Institutes was to discuss, of course, the broad guidelines with the scientific and medical leadership there, but to have those best qualified then to guide our hand or to, or to guide the process, if you will, in terms of implementing those guidelines uh, as related to the various institutes and the research taking place uh, therein. Um, where research was uh, in progress and to, to cease or to shut that research down and it would have been destructive to it, uh, arrangements were made to keep it going. Uh, it was on a case-by-case -case basis that those decisions were made, but the, the attempt was not to, to, to be destructive to any research or trials or, or so forth that were in progress uh, during the shutdown. So those would have been kept going. So it's done on a case-by-case -case basis, which means that it tends to be arbitrary, somewhat capricious, because I know of a lot of researchers who are so frustrated because they really felt they had to get back to the laboratory to continue with the research, which again was uh, going to pay off in terms of uh, um, health as well as uh, financially, too. And so I guess that's a problem that you face in the medical field. It is a big problem. We, don't, we do not uh, like to be in the position of looking uh, at a researcher across his or her bench and saying that we do not think that his or her research uh, as is, 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 is important, uh, as we don't want to be looking across that bench saying that any of our employees are not essential. But it is on a case-by-case -case basis, and I said we do it in collaboration with the scientific and medical leadership uh, within the various institutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, mention um, uh, ha had been made of trust funds, whether it's Social Security, but the Medicare trust fund. How would you feel in, about using that for the new um, Medicare recipients or clients? Because you held off uh, 
signing them, signing them up under the shutdown, right? Could you not have used trust fund money for that? Yes, we could. And, and as I said before, we were, it, we were about to, I remember I said we had a short term and a long term plan. Mm -hmm. In the short term, we were not receiving applications. Uh, we knew in the longer term, because of the backlogs and the destruction that now starts uh, as a result of developing those backlogs, that we would have to bring people back and start mm -hmm. to take the applications. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Horn probably wants to continue with that question. And just one final point. I just wondered, did you all come up with some um, plans for uh, those uh, employees that uh, um, were considered non-essential, even though we hate that term, uh, because they would call my office panic-stricken about what do I do if I need money for cash flow, even though I have an assurance I'll be paid later? Do I file for unemployment? Uh, what, what is the status? I know some of you mentioned hotlines were available. Did you have anything that was kind of consistent, uniform, that came, whether it would be from OMB or whether you put it together and met together in terms of discussing how to ease the panic that people had who had to pay mortgages and tuition and whatever? Anybody want to comment on it? Yes, I'd like to respond to that uh, because I think there were uh, a number of initiatives that took place during this time. First of all, for our employees, you've heard us testify that many of the agencies set up a hotline for their own employees, and ours was used to the maximum. We also prepared uh, on our own questions and answers about unemployment, when to file, whether to file, the pros and cons of doing so. We made the applications available to all of our field office employees throughout the United States. The hotline was for all 66,000 employees scattered all over the country. And I think it's important that we remember that not every one of our federal employees reads the Washington Post or watches C-SPAN or CNN. And so there really was a need for much communication, uh, particularly outside of the Beltway. We did that, and I know that many of the agencies represented here and elsewhere uh, put together a very detailed communication plan with our employees. Most of us have employee assistance programs that are ongoing. I know that we had many psychological problems brought to our attention because of the worries uh, about payments and so on, and I think we provided the best uh, we could for that particular purpose. But I'd also like you to know that there is a group of us called the President's Management Council that meets on a monthly basis. It's chaired by Mr. Koskinen. And at that President's Management Council, those of us who are responsible for mannering, uh, managing agencies have an opportunity to talk with each other. So in addition to the formal kinds of things that you've been talking about today, there was a great deal of informal communication between and among us. What did you do since you were here longer than I? Or how would you handle this? Or how do you deal with patient care because we're worried about our SSI beneficiaries? That sort of thing. So there was a great deal of concern, I think, expressed by the agencies and a wonderful informal system for sharing information as well. That sounds like a great idea in terms of uh, continuing the kind of networking and sharing ideas. It just seems as though maybe from what you said, um, there also needs to be put into effect some consistent policy for how to respond to the needs, realizing that some of them will be different from agency to agency, but in general, so that you all have combined the information and have it available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady and yield uh, for one final question from Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A number of my colleagues, including the chairman, have mentioned the subject of Medicare. I'd just like to pursue a few things on that. As I understand it, new applications for Medicare had to be turned away initially. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, now, Medicare does operate from a trust fund that we all contribute into. Uh, was uh, the processing of applications paid for from that trust fund? That is my understanding. Uh, would uh, the Department of Health and Human Services support legislation to make the costs of processing new applications payable from that trust fund when there has been a lapse of appropriations, or do you need that authority? 
Uh, as I understand it, the, by that there being a trust fund, that's why we were able to continue to operate because under the trust fund's authority, even though there was a lapse, uh, we could continue to use trust fund dollars. What was the uh, reason why we turned away Medicare applications from the beginning? By apply when we applied the the law and the guidelines uh, as 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 we interpreted them, and that's why I said earlier on there was a short term and a long term plan. But in the initial application, if it was going to be a short term um, um, uh, shutdown. Uh, under the guidelines, as we looked at issues related to health, safety, and the protection of property, it was appropriate to have the first instance uh, shut down and by that turning away the applicants. Uh, as time went on, uh, then applying those same guidelines, uh, that, that logic then shifted uh, where it, it, under the same set of guidelines, it was then appropriate to entertain bringing people back uh, to process, process those same applications. Was that uh, shifting logic helped by a call from the White House? No. No. Well, we process applications for Medicare. I'd you like process to say them no. or? Okay. And you're saying no. You got no further guidance. Seems to me that's a fairly political hot potato. And if I were sitting in the White House, I'd say what nincompoop said we shouldn't take applications in this area. Well, it's, it's a little bit like what you have to say about applications for Medicare applies, of course, to the fact that we didn't take applications for disability benefits or for new uh, Social Security benefits. Um, I like to think of it a little bit like a leaky roof. If your roof leaks, you can put a pot under the leak and collect the water, and you can do that for a few days. But as the leaks magnify, and pretty soon your whole roof is leaky, then you have a very, very damaged house. So I see all of this as what the assumptions that we made in the beginning is that the furlough would be very short-lived and we could uh, do that in a short period of time. But based on our experience, we know that backlogs uh, accumulate. And over time, there is no way we could implement the intent of the trust funds if we keep delaying. And therefore, the phase two or the plans came into play for recalling more employees than we had in the first place. Now, in the case of Medicare, because we send out a notice to beneficiaries uh, a month or so before they turn 65, we ask the people to come in ahead of time to give us ample time to process the applications. So there wasn't an emergency. It's not as though somebody needed Medicare tomorrow because we hopefully would have them come into the office a week or two weeks or a month ahead of time to do all of that. So that was the nature of the taking of Medicare applications in our offices. Okay, so you're saying, Commissioner, that you made the decision to reopen the application line for Medicare. Is that correct? OMB, as far as I'm concerned, reviewed our plans, but I was responsible for making the decision about how to and when to recall additional employees to implement uh, the trust fund charge. What did your initial memorandum or planning documents say as to the extent of a short run shutdown? Are we, we talking three days, four days, two days, what? We were working on a theoretical short term, long term, never expecting that we would have to think about a long term. In the beginning, for planning purposes, I think some of our staff started to operate on a, what would happen if this went on for two weeks. But after the first day, uh, when we realized that we had 28,000 applications that we couldn't take and 200,000 telephone calls that we couldn't answer, we knew that it could never, ever go on that long if we were to indeed carry out the intent of the law. Okay, so the original plan that there is such a thing as a short run was simply an error. Is that correct? It was a short-term best guess based on some assumptions. Yeah, in other words, as far as you're concerned, if we went through this again, hopefully we won't, but if we did, you're saying we, we should not be furloughing anybody that has anything to do with these thousands of applications that pour into your administration and that you handle, you say, for Medicare. 
that we shouldn't even have a 24-hour If we furlough. were to do this again, I would want to furlough a very minimum number of our employees because we are now already behind. So it's not just the new cases that we wouldn't be able to process, it's the ones that we are now working on uh, with increased productivity to make up for what we lost. Yeah, so the short-term, long-term distinction really makes no sense when it comes to this type of government operation, is that correct? Well, it made sense in the beginning. Because well, I don't see that assume. it made any sense. You knew the volume coming in every day. It hasn't changed, presumably, over the years. Well, one always suspects that a furlough would be short-lived and therefore we can make do because we only need one bucket to catch the water in the leaky roof. Well, it's an interesting analogy, but it doesn't have any relationship to reality, <laughs> uh, is my conclusion after hearing the leaky roof approach. It seems to me if you go through this again, uh, we shouldn't assume it will be short. Unless the President signs on the Appropriations Bill or the continuing resolution, it could be very long. How do we know? So it seems to me I would hope the next time we do not, on essential health services, shut down the operation, since there is a choice to be made. Now, I take it neither the President nor the Secretary of HHS called and said, what are you people doing over there? Well, the Secretary of HA said she wouldn't have called in any event because we're now an independent I know you're independent. agency. However, I would say this But she to you, does have HICFA still. Yes, she does. And my point is that one of the issues that we've not really discussed in this whole um, problem has to do with the interaction of agencies, uh, the cooperativeness that we experience on a weekly uh, basis. SSA can, can make some assumptions, but we have to work cooperatively with the Department of Health and Human Services as we do all the time. We've also had to be in contact with the Department of, uh, of Immigration Services because we do a lot with INS. So there is a whole cooperative element within government that we all need to pay attention to as well. Just to get the record complete, when I asked you the question initially, Mr. Secretary, uh, you really didn't answer it. I take it you there was no influence since health, uh, the Medicare administration is still in your agency. There was no influence from the President, the White House, anyone else to get you to help unravel the mistake of not taking applications. As I said before, Congressman, and in, ter and in terms of I, I received no phone call, we had a short-term, long-term approach. Uh, uh, I understand your, your concern and disagreement with that. I think we were operating off of history. That's all we had to guide us. Um, uh, history had demonstrated uh, shutdowns had been very short in duration in the past. Some had been averted altogether. And that's why I said in my opening statement, I think the only way we can be on solid ground here is to make sure we do everything possible, uh, both branches of government working together to avoid at all costs any shutdowns in the future. Well, we hope you're right. Thank you, Mr. Well, I thank uh, our panelists uh, for their testimony today. And uh, we have additional questions which we'd like to submit. Uh, time does not permit us to... Uh, offer all the questions from both sides of the aisle uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, I hope, uh, Mr. Munez, you'll also tell the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Mr. Rubin, that we're carefully watching his raid on the employee uh, retirement uh, funds and uh, also extend our regards uh, to him for the holidays. So we'll be watching that <laughs> issue. You'll hear more about that later on. But uh, I would like to thank each of the panelists uh, for their uh, cooperation and uh, close with a uh, uh, comment uh, uh, that uh, the pres President Clinton and uh, Vice President Gore made uh, to all the federal employees after that closed down. And I'll just quote one line. Uh, you remain good people caught in what Churchill called, quote, the worst system of government devised by the wit of man, except for all others. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll excuse this panel. of Winston Churchill. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our second uh, panel today. We have in our second panel the Honorable John uh, Koskigan, Deputy Director for Management of the Office of Management and Budget. We also have uh, Christopher 
uh, Shader, Deputy Assistant Attorney General, the Office of Legal Policy, the Department of Justice. And we have Alan uh, Hewerman, Associate Director for Human Resource Services, uh, the Office of uh, Personnel Management. Uh, most of the panelists have been before us uh, before. If we could have uh, everyone uh, go ahead and exit. Uh, get uh, order here in the uh, hearing room. Uh, most of you have been before us before. know it's the custom to uh, swear in our, uh, our uh, witnesses. If you'll rise, raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Well, welcome back, uh, Mr. Koskigan, uh, the Office of Management Budget. As you know, we try to uh, have you abbreviate uh, your statement, and we will uh, make your entire uh, comments part of the record. Uh, so we welcome you, and you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may ask your indulgence to add a few seconds to my response because I'd like to build into my oral testimony responses to some of the questions that the panel That's has raised. That's fine. Go right ahead. I appreciate the invitation to appear today before the House Civil Service Committee to discuss the shutdown of government service that occurred in the middle of November because of the lack of appropriations. The federal government shut down because neither a complete set of appropriation bills nor a continuing resolution was enacted in a timely way. The Constitution and the Anti-Deficiency Act require that an agency only incur obligations to make payments when the Congress has passed and the President has signed either an appropriation bill for the agency or a temporary appropriation known as a continuing resolution. I think at this point I would like to make a couple points clear. I'm sure the committee understands. First, as Mr. Munoz noted, the law is very clear that it is a violation of the criminal law to, in fact, uh, misapply uh, the Anti-Deficiency Act. Secondly, the Congress has made it clear after the last shutdown, by adding the word imminent before a threat to life or property, that the act is to be applied narrowly. Thirdly, I would like to note that it is not a matter of choice among the agencies as to whether they might do something they would like to do, and nor can it be a response to the interests of anyone. The question is, what are the legal guidelines, what are the applicable guidelines, and how is the law to be interpreted as a, and applied? The failure to enact appropriation bills resulted in substantial cost to taxpayers and degradation of government services. The clearest lesson to be drawn from the recent government shutdown is that it should not be allowed to happen again. Disputes over budget priorities should not be resolved in a crisis atmosphere in which federal workers and recipients of government services are needlessly harmed. With regard to the government-wide impact of the shutdown, we ask the agencies to submit preliminary estimates of the effects of the shutdown on their operations and the resulting costs. The monetary costs are currently estimated at more than $700 million, with approximately $400 to $450 million of that being payroll costs for furloughed employees. Significant additional costs that cannot be determined at this time include interest payments to third parties required under the Prompt Payment Act and the Cash Management Improvement Act when the federal government does not pay its bills on time. There will also be additional personnel costs necessary to deal with the backlog of work resulting from the shutdown. As significant as the monetary costs are the denial of basic and important services to the American public. Millions of Americans were inconvenienced or will be delayed in the receipts of payments and benefits to which they are entitled. Some agencies and activities were already funded and therefore were allowed to continue to function during the shutdown. For example, the Department of Agriculture did not shut down because its appropriation bill had been enacted into law. And the U.S. Postal Service did not shut down because it is funded through fees. The major exception to the prohibition against incurring an obligation without an appropriation is for emergency actions to protect against imminent threats to life or property. For the record, I would like to clear up a very unfortunate use of the terms essential and non-essential, which unfortunately we've continued to talk about this morning. These terms do not appear anywhere in the statute. I would emphasize that. These terms do not appear anywhere in the statute. When there are no appropriations, all employees are furloughed except for those performing activities that provide for national security, relate to the conduct of foreign relations, provide for continuing mandatory benefit payments, and, most importantly, which covers most of the workers we're talking about, for emergency activities to protect life and property. For example, medical care of inpatients and emergency outpatient care. 
If the distinction were between essential and non-essential, no employees would have been furloughed. In light of this subcommittee's long interest in and backing of a properly supported workforce, I know that you will join me to ensure that henceforth the shutdown distinctions are between emergency and non-emergency employees. As under past administrations, the Office of Management and Budget was responsible for preparing for the possibility of a shutdown. During the summer, in light of the delays in congressional actions on virtually all appropriation bills, speculation increased about a possible government shutdown due to a funding hiatus. As a result, Director Rifflin asked me to lead a working group to prepare for an orderly shutdown. This group was composed primarily of OMB staff, but included outside representatives from agencies such as the Department of Justice. Director Rivlin asked the Attorney General for advice regarding the permissible scope of government operations during a lapse in appropriations because, as I noted earlier, after the last shutdown in October of 1990, Congress had amended the Anti-Deficiency Act to insert the words imminent before the th words threat to life or property. On August 16, 1995, the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice updated the 1981 opinion of the Attorney General, interpreting the law pertaining to government operations during a lapse in appropriations. On August 22nd, Director Rivlin asked that the heads of all executive departments and agencies send to OMB updated contingency plans to deal with a funding hiatus based on the 1981 Attorney General's opinion as updated by the Department of Justice. There's been a tone of irony in this hearing. On the one hand, we've been accused of planning too far and ahead and providing too much planning. And on the other hand, we've been accused of not providing enough planning. Let me make a few things clear. <clears throat> Congressman Klinger, Chairman Klinger, referred to the July 26th advice to the agencies from Director Rivlin. That advice clearly states, as does the subsequent advice on August 17th, that the advice there to the agencies was with regard to the ultimate impact of declines as a result of appropriation bills that might be passed. Neither of those guidances asked for updated shutdown plans. The actual request, as noted in my testimony, came on, October, on August 22nd. We have asked, these questions have been raised about inconsistencies across the board. As noted uh, by Secretary <coughs> Administrator Chater, inconsistencies are built into the operation of the government. Social Security is forward funded, has a continuing obligation, and therefore historically limited administrative functions have been implied from that situation. VA benefits are appropriated. In the absence of an appropriation, there is no ability to imply an, an exception for employees unless there is an emergency. We talked about the Civil Service Retirement Fund. The Civil Service Retirement Fund continued to operate because, in fact, those operations were paid for by the Retirement Fund. So as we go across the board, the inconsistencies arise not because of a difference in view of the agencies, but because of a difference of legal and financial situation of the programs being considered. When agencies were asked to review their plans, they were told to assume a short shutdown with the understanding that plans would need revision in light of a more protracted, protracted shutdown and might need to be adjusted for unforeseeable circumstances. OMB assumed this, this was appropriate because shutdown since 1981 had averaged two days. With the participation of the Department of Justice, we reviewed the plans for general conformity with the general, Attorney General's opinion and government-wide consistency. The working group also developed a commonly set, quest, set of questions with appropriate answers for distribution to the agencies. These materials were integrated with those developed by the Office of Personnel Management for employment issues, such as the impact of furloughs on employees' pay, leave, and benefits. Fortunately, a continuing resolution was enacted before the beginning of the fiscal year, providing funding through November 13th. Again, we asked for plans on August 22nd, planning for a potential shutdown on September 30th, six weeks in advance. I might note in passing, that uh, one of the reasons we were planning in advance was the Speaker of the House had made it clear in April and June that his plan was, in fact, to shut the government down. However, by November 9th, only two appropriation bills had been enacted for fiscal year 1996. Therefore, Director Rivlin informed the heads of executive departments and agencies that it was possible that Congress would not pass a second acceptable continuing resolution by November, Monday, November 13th. With regard to Congressman Moran's very good question about what happened on the 13th, on August, on November 9th, uh, there is guidance the committee has a copy of from Director Rivlin advising the employees that the agencies that you should review your shutdown plans and ensure, quote, that your employees are properly informed. On November 13th, we advised the agencies that there was great risk that there would not be a continuing resolution, but I would remind the committee in response to Congressman Moran's question that the continuing resolution or the appropriations in the continuing resolution did not expire until midnight Monday. We, therefore, were obligated through the night on Monday to see what the Congress would do. Historically, in the past, on many occasions, the Congress has actually acted the day after the appropriation. 
So the judgment was made that rather than furloughing employees and having no one here on Tuesday in the face of a potential continuing resolution, we should behave as we had historically always done, which, which was to bring everyone in with notification beforehand as to who were going to be emergency employees and who were not going to be designated emergency. And if there were no continuing resolution on Thursday, Tuesday morning, by the middle of the day in an orderly shutdown, activities would be shut down and those would in fact be in obligations incurred by the government for the employees through the time that they spent working on that day. On the morning of November 14th, Director Rivlin advised the agencies to proceed with the shutdown in, in the face of the absence of a continuing resolution. As the shutdown continued for an unprecedented period of time, and I think that's one of the things this committee should bear in mind, the Congress had never in history caused the government to shut down for more than two working days. By the time we got to Thursday and Friday, we were in uncharted, unprecedented history. The Congress, for the first time, had shut the government down for a period of four working days heading into the weekend. As the shutdown continued, agencies were asked by OMB to review the implementation of their plans for developing emergency situations. As a result, on November, Friday, November 17th, the Social Security Administration and the Veteran Administration received approval to call back a number of personnel to work on Monday, November 20th. On Sunday, November 19th, HUD and the Department of Defense announced plans to recall a number of other workers to address developing emergencies. I'm sorry that uh, Congressman Horn is not here. The question has been raised, isn't it inconsistent to say that someone is not an emergency employee on the first day and then on the fifth day determine that they are? And I think Administrator Chater's response is exactly right. The law imposes a criminal fine and a criminal penalty on anyone who overinterprets the act. It is logical to assume that what is an emergency on the first day may not be an emergency on the fourth day, and conversely, what you can tolerate for a day or two becomes intolerable with the passage of time. There is no way, and I think again in response to Congressman Corn Horn's question, that if we do it again, we will plan on a day-by-day -day basis if there is a shutdown, and for the first two or three days, we will in fact have a shutdown depending upon who are emergency employees and functions for the first two or three days. If we go for a longer period of time, I would expect that the agencies would continue to monitor and review their plans, and after five or seven days, we would have additional determinations made as to who was now an emergency and who was not an emergency employee. In some areas like parks, you may have an emergency activity for the first three days shutting the parks down, at which point you then can have those furloughs, employees furloughed because they're no longer engaged in emergency activities. And so therefore, I think it's important to bear in mind that it is not a sign of inconsistency on the part of the agencies that determinations continued to be made, especially as we moved into unprecedented territory. If we started again, I think that we would find, in the cases of HUD and other places, that for the first day or two, we could tolerate the situation in a way that we could not tolerate at the end of five or seven days. You asked how our determination would differ if the lapse of appropriation were to last another 10 days, 30 days, or even 90 days. I would like to stress, and I cannot stress it too hard, that a shutdown of more than two weeks would be so disruptive that it should not even be considered. In such extreme circumstances, the hardship to all federal employees, emergency and non-emergency, as well as military personnel, all federal contractors, grantees, and anyone else dealing with the federal government, with the exception of recipients of certain mandatory benefits, none of whom would receive payment, would be without precedent. And again, I would remind the committee that there is an assumption that if we bring back a furloughed employee to perform a function, that that solves the problem. As we noted on that weekend, we were about to move beyond a situation of who were emergency employees and who were not and deal with a situation that the government had no money to pay either the emergency employees or the non-emergency employees, was about to have no money to pay the military was employees, was about to not have money to pay any bills that were not subject to the appropriation. The Anti-Deficiency Act does not allow us to make payments. The Anti-Deficiency Act in emergency circumstances only allows us to incur the obligation to have workers and contractors performing emergency activities to perform the work. We have no authority to pay them. We have no funds to pay them because of the lack of an appropriation. Uh, Mr. Koskinen, your testimony is very valuable to us, but we only have about six minutes to vote. So if okay. I could... Can I just close then with my last I'll paragraph. let you close with the last Thank you. sentence. And then Thank you. Shutting, the federal, shutting the federal government down is a serious matter with substantial costs and significant dislocations for the American public. For more than 200 years, major budgetary issues between the Congress and the executive branch were settled without major disruptions in government op operations. Our goal should be to emulate, emulate that minimum standard of success. If that goal is unattainable, we should at least not subject the country to another shutdown this year. Thank you, Madam Chairman.
Thank you. The subcommittee will now uh, recess for 15 minutes for the vote. meeting of the subcommittee back to order and uh, we will resume I thank uh, Mr. Koskigan for his testimony and we will get back to you with uh, questions but uh, at this time I want to call on uh, Christopher Schrader uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Office of Legal Policy the Department of Justice excuse me if I've slaughtered your name a couple of times here I've said Sh Schrader and that's uh, very close mr. chairman okay good and Schroeder I called you earlier she's leaving but uh, <laughs> <coughs> we're glad to have you with us uh, thank you you're recognized and again if you want to uh, uh, submit uh, a lengthy uh, statement uh, for the record uh, prepared we, we will do that without objection and if you could summarize thank you the other members will be returning and are interested thank you thank you mr. chairman and members of the committee um, this is the first time I'm appearing before your committee and I hate to start it with an apology but I must uh, my testimony arrived uh, late this morning and uh, contrary to your request for it being here in advance and when it arrived it was at, without fairly extensive appendices I understand that those are now available but again my apologies for the late arrival. It's inexcusable, and I won't attempt to excuse it. Um, I'll, I will offer to uh, be available for questions at the staff level or in any other way you uh, would think appropriate in order to uh, accommodate the committee's That's fine. interest. And just proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Koskinen has covered a number of the uh, points I make in my testimony, so let me just briefly summarize the role of the Justice Department with respect to implementing. Uh, uh, government-wide application of the Anti-Deficiency Act. Uh, the Justice Department's function is to provide general legal advice uh, working with the Office of Management and Budget, and in recent years that responsibility within the department has fallen primarily on my office, the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, the advice we have given over the years, however, originated uh, with an Attorney General opinion in 1981 uh, from then Attorney General uh, Civiletti. Uh, that, uh, basic interpretation of the uh, legal regime governing a situation of lapsed appropriations has been in place since 1981 and has been consistently followed by the administrations of uh, Presidents Carter, Reagan, Bush, and now President Clinton. Assistant Attorney General Dellinger of uh, the Office of Legal Counsel issued a memorandum on August 16th of this year in response to a request <coughs> from Director Rivlin to assess the implications of an amendment to the Anti-Deficiency Act that was enacted in 1990. And that was the occasion of the uh, August 16th memorandum. That memorandum largely uh, reiterates the Civiletti uh, opinions and the views of the proper legal standards to be applied in this situation that have been in place uh, at least since 1981 and does amend the Civiletti advice with respect to the interpretation of the emergency exception, which was the subject matter that was addressed in the 90 amendments. Uh, it is our function to provide legal advice, and the, the most significant laws we must interpret are um, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, the Appropriations Clause, and uh, Sections 1341 and 42 of uh, Title 31 of the United States Code, the Anti-Deficiency Act. Um, the only point of which I will uh, be somewhat repetitious is, uh, is to uh, simply reiterate the point that's been made a number of times already this morning. Uh, the structure of the Anti-Deficiency Act is such that um, in the situation of a lapse of appropriations, first, no funds can be withdrawn from the Treasury, uh, and second, uh, there are limited exceptions provided in the, the Act for the incurring of obligations, such as to commitments to pay employees who are uh, not furloughed and who remain at their posts. But in no situation uh, in the recent uh, shutdown where furloughed employees who were coming in on that basis in a position actually to receive a paycheck if we went to a payday that was uh, the covered periods of the, uh, the shutdown period. We can obligate the government to honor those uh, compensation promises uh, but unless, unless and until there's an appropriation, uh, it would not have been possible to, um, 
to meet the normal pay periods. Uh, fortunately, we've never confronted a payless or a partially payless payday uh, because uh, the matter has been resolved prior to then. Um, but it is, it is fundamental to note that uh, when the government is functioning in this period, it's functioning essentially on the basis of its ability to make contractual obligations. And that ability is, is limited to those categories that are defined <coughs> under the Anti-Deficiency Act as what we refer to as accepted activities. Nowhere is the concept of an essential worker or an essential function found in any of those uh, definitions of accepted activities. Um, what we do analyze are activities and functions to see whether under the facts and circumstances that exist um, on a fairly case-by-case -case basis, uh, there is a justification for an employee performing that function. And those circumstances can and do change over time, uh, which, as um, Mr. Koskinen explained, is, is one of the reasons why um, employees might be asked to perform a function uh, at a certain day during a shutdown period and not on others. Um, you can, uh, we used an example in, our in one of our memorandum of uh, truck or vehicle maintenance not being an accepted function assuming a short-term shutdown, but obviously if you were maintaining a motor vehicle fleet to perform some otherwise authorized government activity, as time went on, you would have to perform some maintenance on those vehicles or they would become unsafe to a degree that uh, the protection of property or the safety of human life would be involved. So that the longer a shutdown went on, the more uh, likely it would be that some agency's uh, motor pool would have to call maintenance staff in to perform rudimentary services. A contrary example would be the kind of situation some of the large national parks may have faced um, in which, uh, although there was no funding available to uh, continue the operation of those parks, when the lapse in appropriations occurred, there were still people in the interiors of large parks like Yosemite or Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon and there was a rationale for Park Service personnel staying at their stations to ensure the safety of those individuals while they hiked out of the park, which often could take a couple of days. So that at the beginning of a shutdown, there would be a health and safety rationale for maintaining some personnel that would then cease. So the facts and circumstances uh, are definitely a factor that agencies take into account. And that's one significant reason that uh, plans and uh, staffing levels have to be updated and, and uh, reassessed uh, in light of the circumstances that are uh, the best estimates and understandings of the circumstances that uh, obtain at the time those decisions are made. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks and be more than happy to respond to any questions you may have. We thank you and we'll get back to questions. At this time, I'll recognize Alan Hewerman, Associate Director for Human Resources Systems Service of the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the Office of Personnel Management's role in the partial shutdown of the federal government that began on November 14, 1995. The role of OPM under a government shutdown is to provide agencies with guidance and technical assistance related to the personnel management aspects of furloughing federal employees. Uh, last July, based on media reports about the possibility of a lapse in appropriation, I, on my own initiative, instructed my staff uh, to begin uh, updating OPM's furlough guidance, which was last issued on August 15, 1990. On August 1, 1995, we distributed our updated guidance to agencies. This guidance was in the form of questions and answers which covered a broad range of information on personnel management aspects of the furlough, uh, such as information on procedures, the effect of the furlough on pay and leave and retirement, health insurance coverage and other benefits. Uh, the guidance did not because it's not within OPM's authority. Uh, did not include guidance on the kinds of activities which would be accepted under the Anti-Deficiency Act during the lapse in appropriations. After issuing this guidance, we engaged in continuing discussions with federal agencies to help plan for a possible lapse in appropriations to assure that they were kept informed and up to date. Our activities included OPM staff briefings for personnel at a number of agencies, weekly meetings of agency personnel directors where we continued to address the personnel implications of furlough as new issues arose, uh, arranged for representatives of, from OMB to speak on budgetary matters relating to shutdown, for representatives from the Department of Labor to discuss unemployment compensation issues, and for representatives from the Thrift Investment Board 
to discuss thrift savings plan issues regarding loans. Uh, we also distributed to agencies additional questions and answers pertaining to new issues on the personnel aspects of furlough, uh, a Justice Department opinion on the 1990 changes to the Anti-Deficiency Act relative to determining accepted and non-accepted activities, and information on unemployment compensation and thrift savings plans. Prior to and during the shutdown, OPM responded to individual inquiries from agencies, employees, unions, and the media on personnel aspects of furlough. On November 17, we issued to directors of personnel questions and answers addressing leave issues affecting accepted and non-accepted employees. On November 21, the day after the law authorizing retroactive pay was enacted and employees returned to work, we issued guidance on personnel documentation and on how to handle the pay and leave of employees for that period. Mr. Chairman, you asked about the assumptions made by OPM with respect to the length of the shutdown. Uh, we made no assumptions and none were needed with respect to our guidance. Our August guidance provided information on furloughs of 30 days or less and on furloughs of more than 30 days. The reason for this distinction is that there are different provisions in law governing furloughs depending on the length of the furlough. Furloughs of less than 30 days require adverse action procedures. Furloughs of more than 30 days require reduction in force procedures. Therefore, OPM's guidance was designed to cover both scenarios. If, as the shutdown continued, it appeared that it would last for an extended period, we would encourage agencies to provide employees with additional information, such as on employee assistance programs and financial counseling. However, our basic guidance on the personnel aspects of furlough would remain the same. You asked about the effect of a debt ceiling crisis on our guidance. The debt ceiling limits the government's ability to borrow cash, and therefore our guidance dealing with furlough procedures would not be affected. You also asked for a description of those OPM functions that were continued during the lapse in appropriations. OPM continued to carry out its responsibilities with regard to administration of federal employee benefits programs, such as retirement, health and life insurance, background suitability investigations, and managerial and executive training. These activities are funded out of either the retirement or insurance trust funds or OPM's revolving fund, and so are not affected by the lapse in appropriated funds. OPM also conducted activities related to the orderly shutdown of both OPM itself and other federal agencies. With regard to the costs associated with the furlough, we estimate that the salary and benefits paid to OPM employees who were furloughed totals approximately $1,238,700. We also incurred some incidental costs, such as printing, mailing, and travel in connection with the orderly shutdown. We are providing you with inf all of the information you requested, including copies of all materials we issued with regard to the government shutdown and all pertinent documents associated with the shutdown at OPM. I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss this with you today, and I'll be glad to respond to questions. I thank uh, you, Mr. Hume, and also other uh, panelists, uh, uh, witnesses today for their testimony. Uh, I have a few questions uh, to start out with. Uh, first, for Mr. Koskigan, uh, do you think that the uh, Anti-Deficiency Act is uh, deficient? Is which? Deficient. <coughs> Uh, no, I think it, uh, whatever modifications you make in it, I think ultimately you're dealing with a provision of the Constitution <coughs> that provides that the uh, uh, executive branch cannot take, uh, incur obligations without appropriations. The Anti-Deficiency Act basically, as I noted in my testimony, provides some very narrow exceptions for having employees perform emergency activities and, and other activities, but does not provide any exceptions and cannot to the constitutional requirement that we can't Pay, make any payments uh, and can only incur very limited obligations in the absence of an appropriation. So if there's any deficiency, it's in fact in our inability to produce uh, either appropriation bills or continuing resolutions to avoid this problem. As I said, we, we avoided it for 200 years. It's not quite clear to me why suddenly it's become, uh, you know, a term of art. Well, I think everyone who's testified today that said uh, shut, has said that shutdowns have been uh, sort of a way of life of gover governing uh, the past <clears throat> 10, 12 years, uh, uh, given the fact that I guess it's occurred on at least 10 occasions. Uh, and uh, the difference, I think, in this particular shutdown was the duration. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we heard from the panelists, uh, uh, previous panelists, was a variety in their plans for uh, such an eventuality. Some prepared, it seems, short term and long term. Do you feel? That the guidelines that you issued or request were sufficient, 
and what the, the, how they responded was, uh, was adequate. And then we saw a great disparity between the uh, plans. I, I did the uh, presentation of this uh, 184 pages of the Department of um, Labor versus the uh, uh, two pages and uh, 30 pages uh, addendum for HHS, I believe it was. Uh, what's your reflection on yes. this now? Our, our reflection is the agencies were advised that it, we, they should plan for a short uh, shutdown uh, in light of the history that we'd never had a shutdown for more than one or two days. When agency asked for more detailed guidance, we said, as you heard, that it would be in the range of five to seven days. Uh, all of the plans and all of our uh, discussions with them contemplated uh, that if the shutdown lasted longer, uh, it would begin to uh, cause people to have to <coughs> re-examine uh, developing emergencies in their activities. So it did not surprise us, and in fact, we encouraged the agencies as the first week drew to a close to review their plans in light of the unprecedented nature of the shutdown. Uh, and I would note, the question was raised about the, uh, the next other point about the difference in the size of the plans. Uh, the agencies have been required to maintain shutdown plans since 1980. Uh, the guidance uh, from Director Rivlin on uh, August 22nd specifically notes that the purpose of the review was for the agencies to review those existing plans in light of the new legislation and the updated Attorney General's opinion provided by the Office of Legal Counsel and make whatever changes seemed appropriate. In the case of some agencies, they went back as Labor did and in fact redid their plans entirely. The Defense Department, perhaps for the first time in history, actually developed a shutdown plan. Other agencies like HHS that had relatively straightforward questions and pre-existing plans had an easier time of it. But it was left to the discretion of the agency as to determine what and how much work was necessary to update their pre-existing plans. <clears throat> one of the other points that uh, you raised that uh, one of the reasons for different shutdown, uh, degrees of shutdown, was in fact the legal <clears throat> parameters that have been established. And uh, one of the areas that was mentioned today that stirred some controversy has been uh, Social Security. I have this uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, <coughs> Office of Legal Counsel <coughs> memorandum that was prepared August 16, 1995. And uh, it, the subject is government operations in uh, the event of a lapse of appropriations. And uh, then it goes on. It it's pretty lengthy. It defines some terms. I'm, I think you might be familiar with it, but it says multi-year appropriations and indefinite appropriations. And let me quote from it. It says, not all government functions are funded with annual appropriations. Some operate under multi-year appropriations and others operate under indefinite uh, appropriation uh, provisions that uh, do not require passage of annual appropriations uh, uh, legislation. Uh, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I'd interpret that, that they could go on. Social Security is such, wait, let me, let me say this again. Social Security is a prominent example of a program that operates under an indefinite appropriations. Uh, given this uh, guideline prepared from the administration, and then we had the Social Security Commissioner over here who furloughed about 60 60,000 employees. Is this, a, uh, is this a, a difference in understanding of the legal uh, parameters or uh, what, how do you interpret the, these actions? The original uh, opinion by Attorney General Civiletti, which drew the distinction and discussed Social Security, talked about situations where you have ongoing continuing obligation authority, as Social Security does. And in those cases, it said by implication, one could assume that limited administrative functions, even though not funded, could continue. And that's the basis under which historically Social Security benefit checks have been issued. Uh, <clears throat> the question is, beyond the limited administ uh, administrative functions of paying existing beneficiaries, can you at the start uh, have an exception uh, because of an emergency activity or otherwise for the processing of and the volume of work that's done in new applications. Social Security's judgment in their plan, and it was very clear in their plan, was that they did not think that for, as uh, Administrator Chater said, for the first day or two there was an emergency or that that would be the kind of work that would be accepted under the, uh, uh, under the Attorney General's opinion. On the other hand, uh, it was clear, as uh, uh, Administrator Chater said, once we got into the unprecedented uh, shutdown because of the inability to provide a continuing resolution, after several days, what had been tolerable for a day or two became intolerable over time. It began to create an emergency. 
Uh, that was their legal judgment under the uh, uh, basic original Attorney General's opinion, and it is function. The original opinion talks about ongoing oblig obligation authority and limited functions derived by implication from that. Do we need changes in the law to uh, uh, to ensure that some essential activities uh, uh, continue? Or can it seemed that there's adequate authority because, in fact, some of these things were restored by a fiat. Uh, uh, they were not restored by fiat. They were restored because of a determination that an emergency had developed with the passage of time. That is not fiat. But, well, but someone has the authority. He has, the president or the administrator has to have that legal authority. Correct. And it can't what, just suddenly appear. Uh, uh, no. But that's why it's not fiat. There's a set of legal guidelines that give you a determination that say, if you determine that a function at any point in time yeah, is necessary so you're because saying it's we an have, emergency. We have basically a moving target. Of that, course. Okay. There, is, there is no way. And, I and you don't need additional... Uh, clarification what's in law is adequate. The, the law has been changed in the past. It certainly can be changed going forward. And as I say, the last change in the law was an attempt to restrict and make it clear that the Congress intended that only imminent threats, the only emergency actions were <coughs> imminent threats to life or property. And that was what we updated. And the Congress has spoken and said that this is to be narrowly defined. Uh, a criminal uh, penalty applies otherwise. If the Congress decided to take another tack, uh, that could be done, and there's nothing that would prevent them from doing that. If the Congress decided, uh, uh, several proposals are before the Congress uh, across the board to either provide permanent continuing resolutions or permanent payments afterwards, or even to redefine in the Congress's judgment as to what an appropriate exception is, the Congress can do that. Uh, yes, I will. I know you have some interest in this area, and you were referred to uh, <coughs> while you were out of the the room uh, by the witness, so I will yield. <laughs> uh, well, the chairman has raised a fascinating question, and as uh, the uh, opinion of Assistant Attorney General Walter Dellinger, a distinguished uh, scholar of the Constitution, <laughs> goes on, he says, in such cases, benefit checks continue to be honored by the Treasury because there's no lapse in the relevant appropriation. My query is, are employees of Social Security paid out of the same trust fund that the checks are paid out of? And my understanding is no, that they are, in fact, freestanding. They are paid out of an S&E account that's an appropriated account. So when uh, Mr. Dellinger wrote this multi-year appropriation, you're saying that his definition, that some operate under multi-year appropriations and others operate under indefinite appropriations provisions that do not require passage of annual appropriations legislation, you're saying that it's one thing to pay benefit checks, it's another to pay people. Is that correct? Yes. If you look on page four of his opinion, he says, 90, referring back to the 9081 opinion, it said it contemplates that a limited number, I would quote, a limited number of government functions uh, could continue. The next sentence says, examples include the check writing and distributing functions necessary to disperse the benefits that operate under indefinite appropriations. And that's what Social Security continued to do. There was never a threat to existing benefits. But the, it, it, the exception is to a limited number of functions, and the example has always been check writing. The issue facing Social Security was, could they deal for, a, for the first few days, would it be a legitimate interpretation to say we'll have a thousands of workers necessary to process new applications? Their interpretation of that and judgment was that that was not an exception created by emergencies until it passed with the passage of time into an unprecedented area where, in fact, now we had a backlog that was an emergency. But going back to day one, if we started and you told me we were going to shut the government down for one day, would Social Security have people there? I would say our position would be to ask Social Security, is that going to create an emergency? Their answer the first time was no. They would again, in light of the experience, be able to answer it. But it would not be inconsistent for them to say, we can tolerate the situation for two days. We cannot tolerate the situation for five. Is it not true that the Financial Management Service of the Treasury writes the Social Security checks? Uh, that's, that's my understanding, but they have to actually, the FMS writes those checks in response to information forwarded by Social Security. Yeah, absolutely, but there is also a payment to the Treasury by Social Security for that service, is there? A payment for the check writing function? Yeah. Uh, at some point, surely. That, right, and, 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 and that includes the employees in the financial management service that have to 
get yes, those a, the, checks this, processed. That's right. Both both the FMS employees and the Social Security employees necessary to process the benefits for check writing are accepted under the Attorney General's opinion. Right, under the Dellinger opinion. Now it's Those are accepted. The, it's not actually under the Civiletti opinion. It's been the rule for 14 years. Yeah. Okay. Well, I notice in your testimony at the bottom of page 2, you say the Social Security Administration was forced to turn away 112,000 claim applications. Everywhere else, you say, in the case of Medicare, 40,000 individuals were delayed in enrolling Medicare. Then you go on to talk about the Park Service, another beef I have. More than 2 million visitors visitors were denied access to the National Park Services. More than 80,000 passport applications were delayed. More than 80,000 visas to visitors who spend an average of $3,000 on the trips were delayed, etc., etc. Then you get down to customer service, internal revenue, were halted. Social Security, you say, was forced. The only person that forced them was the Commissioner of Social Security that made the decision, and OMB that backed her up. <clears throat> because they made a determination that under the law, the law passed by Congress, that was the action they had to take. Uh, it goes back to the Chairman's thing, if you would like to change the law, that's open to you. But that was an interpretation, their judgment, in response to, as I say, the threat, as uh, Secretary Munoz noted, that if you make a violation, uh, you are in fact subject to criminal penalties. The fact that nobody's been prosecuted that I know of, because we've never had in a shutdown that lasted years. more than five or six days, does not seem to me uh, particularly great comfort to anyone you're asking to make these judgments. Yeah. Well, I, Mr. Chairman, we obviously have a clear case where mm -hmm. your committee can render a service to well, straighten out the law on this subject one way or the other. I, again, a uh, number of questions have been raised <clears throat> wondering whether we should file criminal charges against those gardeners at VA that were non-essential. It's, it's my understanding that is noted that 10 percent of the 200,000 or 220,000 people who work in the hospitals were furloughed, and in fact my understanding is uh, non-emergency activities support services necessary to support the emergency activities. Well, the same thing. Uh, relates to PR uh, shops. I mean, we have thousands well, of PR people in the various agencies. And, but, but you heard and, from... You heard <coughs> someone from could make a case for... Uh, uh, someone could make a case for uh, going after some of these folks that uh, did keep their <coughs> shop open and that were non-essential and should be charged with a criminal violation. Uh, uh, first of all, they'd be non-emergency, not non-essential. Secondly, you heard from six, sec, sec, six different agencies here, all of whom said they made substantial cuts in their public affairs departments. They'll all provide you those numbers. Uh, and I think, in fact, uh, they're prepared to uh, stand behind those. I do not think it's fair to as assume uh, that there were violations of that law. Well, <clears throat> the folks that we did hear from, uh, there, there are other agencies and activities. I stunned at the number of uh, <clears throat> PR folks and uh, public uh, information officers that we have throughout the uh, vast uh, uh, number of agencies and activities. The other uh, point, and I, I don't want to uh, continue that one at this, this point, but uh, one other final point is um, <clears throat> we have we've gone through one shutdown and it's been the longest one in, in history. Uh, next Friday we may be facing another one and it may be a very long shutdown. Uh, I also heard testimony, and I'm not sure, maybe you could define it, that uh, your agency, OMB, has requested uh, uh, an update from, an additional update based on the experience of, the <coughs> of this uh, bad experience. Um, and was that the 10th? Someone said the 10th yes. and another uh, said it, the 12th. It, it is Sunday evening. We want them so that we will have the full week to review them. Okay. Uh, well, uh, five working days, I believe. And is that a, do you feel that's enough time? Because uh, we had one of the agencies, HUD, said that they had, re hey, they had asked for an opinion from you all uh, relating to some grant programs. I guess it was uh, uh, in the uh, time frame. Uh, prior to the shutdown and uh, did not get a response. So you think that you can a adequately respond, review their plans, and get back to them by the 15th? Yes. Again, uh, as I say, the irony of this is on the one hand, we've been attacked for having spent too much time in planning. Right. And I think the appropriate response is the agencies have, we think, uh, good plans. We've asked them to review them because we think it's appropriate. Uh, to be prepared for the following Friday. We, we do also think that we've, even before this, we've asked uh, the Chief Financial Officers, the President's Management Council, 
uh, and other interagency groups to give us their response over the last month of experiences they had, the lessons learned, as we're calling them. Uh, and we think we will be able to respond and we will be able to run, if there is a necessary, which we hope it is not, uh, again, an efficient and effective shutdown. It's not exactly one of the things we'd like to be involved in. Uh, if you think you're having problems being charged with doing too much or too little, you ought to join the new majority in Congress. <laughs> Uh, we get criticized for either doing too much or too little, too. So, uh, I think you ought to think twice about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with those comments, I do want to defer to the ranking member for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John, will OMB support the legislation that I've introduced that will keep federal employees at work uh, and, uh, and get reimbursed? after the fact in the same way that 60 percent of federal employees did this last time? Yes, we're in favor of what, whatever we could do to, in fact, provide continuity and management in the government. Uh, and to the extent that we could avoid unnecessary shutdowns and termination of important work, that we think would be a, an important step forward. So you'd support H.R. 2184 that, uh, that does that? that yes, we, have not, to we have not cleared that bill through uh, our normal processes, but uh, my personal opinion is that we should support that. Okay. I'm glad to hear that, although we have uh, very little time. So I, I think that uh, if the White House was to support that, it would help. Uh, by my calculations, as of December 15th, we would only be uh, worrying about 10 percent of the federal workforce not going to work. Now, we, our estimate is that if uh, the situation holds uh, that exists today and there were a shutdown at the end of next week without further appropriation bills passing, uh, assuming the plans, the agency plans were consistent with their previous plans, we would be looking at furloughs in the range of 330 to 350,000 employees. Why? Uh, that uh, doesn't make sense to my. Uh, with, it certainly doesn't comport well, you with have my. Several, you have several figures, large agencies. You have you have state justice commerce. Well, the appropriation bill is not passed. You have the VA HUD appropriation bill is not passed. You have EPA when that is not passed. As part of that, you have uh, NASA. You've got a number of very large agencies that do not have appropriations. Um, labor, labor HHS, I guess, is the third. When you take the Labor yeah. Department HHS. Uh, State Commerce and Justice, EPA, and NASA, you've got a fairly significant, the Education Department, significant number of agencies that will not have appropriations. What I did was to assume that VA HUD will not pass, Labor HHS will not pass, Interior will not pass. That's right. Uh, State Justice and Commerce. And start, State Justice and Commerce will not pass is my assumption that it's going to get vetoed. It'll come to us this afternoon, and when it gets to the President, I think he'll veto it. Uh, but I made those assumptions. Uh, and, uh, and then took the number of employees who were furloughed in each of those agencies. And that adds up to something less than 200,000 federal employees. I'd be delighted to uh, share with you our, in our calculations. Okay. I, I would very much be interested in that because it, it certainly impacts not necessarily on what is the right policy, but it certainly impacts on the uh, the uh, consequence of that policy. If we're only talking about less than 200,000 versus three to 400,000, uh, either way, I think this is the time to set in motion a policy that um, uh, would prevent the type of situation that occurred uh, last month from recurring. Uh, but I also think it's important to know the, the scope, the, the depth of the um, impact of a lapsed appropriation. And I think it's, it's terribly important for the White House to give some expedited review of H.R. 2184 that would um, keep federal employees at work. But uh, I'd like to ask you, would you anticipate a change in the proportion of employees who were furloughed the last time the government shut down uh, versus those that you would furlough as of December 15th if there was a, a, a recurrence of a, of a lapsed appropriation situation? Well, we can't answer that question until we hear back from the agencies. Again, our process from the start, starting in the middle of August, has been to rely on the agencies and their counsel and their managers to make the judgments. Uh, and similarly, we'll, we'll rely on them to make their uh, adjustments according to what they now know. 
uh, but nothing has occurred that thus far would lead me to conclude there will be significant changes. Well, I understand that, that you need to hear from the agencies, but we just heard from the agencies. And uh, Shirley Shea, the Commissioner of Social Security, used the uh, analogy of a leaking roof and the, the, uh, that if it goes very long, you have to uh, put far more people back to work to ensure that you don't have a chaotic situation. Uh, the, in the testimony from the um, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of HHS, he indicated that a second shutdown would necessitate more people being employed. That seemed to be consistent with the opinion of all of the agency representatives we heard from this morning. Uh, one reason might be that this could occur at a time when you have to prepare for the issuance of major grants like the AFDC and Medicaid and Social Services, Head Start and the like. Um, so you would need to have those people on board, which you didn't in early November because uh, they had just been uh, issued for the first quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, I'm assuming that there would be a change in terms of the proportion of people furloughed and that, in fact, that change would reflect the need to, hi to have uh, a higher proportion of the workforce on board in, in the event of a, um, of a second uh, lapsed appropriation period. So uh, I, I think we need to look at that. And, and I would like to see your figures because they, they don't jive with mine. It, it, it would appear that at the very most you wouldn't have more than 200,000 people furloughed out of a total of something over 2 million. <coughs> well, uh, on that? We, I, will, I will share those with you. We do, uh, as I say, subject to change and that's why we've asked the agencies formally to give us their updates for all those regions. <laughs> Uh, our number is over 300,000, and I'll share that with you. Yeah, we, okay, we, we need to look at that. Um, what measures is the White House or, or, or uh, OMB in the, in the sense of recommending to the White House taking uh, to avoid the kind of uh, chaos that uh, occurred uh, during the, government, the first government shutdown? In other words, to create a different situation. How have you learned from the last experience to improve? Well, I guess, first of all, I would challenge the question of whether it was chaos. Actually, as the one who uh, fielded all the calls for the 10 days uh, and responded to the agency inquiries, uh, it appeared to us that, in fact, and the agency's response was that it ran smoothly. And you know, some of your constituents, I understand, I gather, have given you anecdotal information otherwise. Our judgment is that the agencies uh, made the right judgments. They informed their employees in a proper time. Clearly, this time around, everyone who was a non-emergency employee the last time will have uh, uh, f uh, fair notice of that. Uh, I think the thing uh, we, s we see the uh, shutdown as having run. As I say, it's not my goal in life to say the trains ran on time, but the shutdown we think ran efficiently and effectively. We're prepared to do it again if necessary. We think it would be a major uh, uh, unfortunate and uh, hopefully avoidable event, and we would hope that the Congress, if it cannot pass, complete the work on the appropriation bills by the middle of December, would pass a continuing resolution to allow the government to continue to function. I understand that, and I would agree that chaos is too strong a term. Uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, OMD, OMB did a commendable job in many areas in preparing for this. It could have been a far more chaotic situation had OMB not been as well managed and communicating as well with the agencies, uh, almost all of whom reacted in a responsible, uh, professional fashion. Uh, a more appropriate term would be um, imperfections in the, uh, in the process. I, I, I would think and I would hope that you would agree that there were some areas that could be improved upon were this to occur. The first would be how do we prevent it from occurring, uh, whether through legislation that would keep employees at work, which I've mentioned, uh, or um, more advance notice, uh, uh, those types of things. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'd, I'd like to get a sense of how things are going to, uh, to occur on December 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th 
uh, versus how things occurred on um, what was the date, November, November 13th. Uh, 12th? <clears throat> 13th and 14th. Yeah, so. Uh, yes. Well, as I say, I think to the extent uh, your constituents have talked to you in, in any particular agency, it's up to the agency to make sure employees receive appropriate notification. As I say, that problem is mooted to some substantial extent because, as I say, the people who were non-emergency employees in November uh, obviously are on notice that they're likely to be non-emergency non employees in mid-December subject to changes by the agencies. Uh, we think that the guidance was clear. We need to make clear the area in which we are working with the agencies to make clear is this issue about funding activities that if you have an ongoing obligation, uh, obligation authority such as Social Security or uh, programs that have been adopted this year by the government, then you can in fact make payments. The question is <clears throat> if there's been no obligation this year, it's an obligation of prior years, uh, then some agencies, a couple agencies decided they could spend S&E or incur S&E obligations in this fiscal year even though there was no congressional action in this year. Uh, most agencies uh, took the other tack, which was consistent with the advice we gave, and we will make sure that there's consistent uh, response to that. And we will review the agency's plans because, again, to the extent that they think on the basis of what uh, their experience was the first time around, they want to make changes in those plans, uh, that's what we're encouraging them to do. Uh, our instructions from the start, and it goes back to the question Congressman Horn asked, from the start uh, in August, with all the meetings we have and all the guidance we gave, our instructions to the agencies was to take the legal guidance, take their earlier plans, and play it right down the middle. We did not reach to go in one direction or another. Uh, we think that, and I continue to believe, this is too serious a matter uh, to run the risk of being uh, uh, legitimately accused of having uh, shut down more of the government than is legally necessary. And that decision has to be made initially by the agencies. Uh, on the other hand, I understand uh, as several of the members here today have said, there are a number of activities that people are unhappy about having shut down. Congressman Horn talked about he's unhappy that people could not go to the parks. Uh, again, those aren't judgments we make. Those are legal decisions that are required by the statute. And our, our role here is to simply apply the law as best we can. I understand what you're saying. I, I do think, though, that uh, they are judgments. They may be legally oriented judgments, but it's still a, a judgment call. And other <coughs> judgment call uh, is with regard to when uh, grants go out because there is a certain amount of discretion in terms of when grants are awarded. I would hope that the grants folk would be busy uh, right now making sure that there is a minimal disruption. Uh, I don't think that they should be granting the, the whole year's uh, uh, funding level if that is not the custom. But um, I would hope that those grants that uh, could go out within a period between, say, December 10th and December the 30th uh, would go out on December 10th. I'm just suggesting that. And uh, it's to, to cause minimal disruption uh, out in the field uh, with grantees who don't need to, I, I would think our objective would be to cause the least suffering possible, the least disruption, the least chaos. Another area where I would think there might be uh, a value in some feedback is those employees who had to remain on the job uh, might have got a better sense of how many other employees and which employees were also necessary given the work that had to be handled during that interim four-day period. I would think that that would, would uh, result in some adjustment of, of the, uh, the numbers of people furloughed and, and who would get furloughed. Uh, has there been any of that type of adjustment that has gotten back to you from any of the agencies? My understanding is the agencies have done, in some cases, very detailed reviews of the experience of the shutdown. We've encouraged them all to do that, uh, not necessarily to plan for the 15th, but one of the things <clears throat> we hope to leave behind is more guidance and more easily accessible materials so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, next time around. The last time OMB looked at shutdown plans, for instance, was 1985. And uh, we think that we will leave behind both at the overall level at OMB and the Justice Department uh, clear records of what happened, but we're encouraging the agencies to do the same thing. So I think we will get uh, uh, more, more, more efficient at this. Although, again, as I say, in the long run, the bottom line is you have to understand that uh, in these situations, the Congress has made a decision not to fund the agencies. We do not have the funding. We do not have authority. So we are looking at narrowly defined exceptions 
to keeping emergency activities going. It's not that anybody, and that's why they say the distinction non-essential and essential evaporates as you listen to the comments made across the board about things that people think are very important that cannot be done because legally we have been not authorized to do them. And so the question really is, uh, the only window in the statute is what are the emergency exceptions for th imminent threats to life or property? There's a significant amount of important work that gets done by the government, and if there's any positive to this shutdown, I think more and more Americans discovered that contrary to some of the assertions made around about, well, nobody noticed, that there were significant amounts of activities that were not done because, in fact, the government had shut down. I appreciate what you're saying, and, uh, and I also support what you have been doing, but 60 percent of the federal government doesn't fall under the category of imminent threat to the safety and protection of property. Uh, I don't argue with your, the legal base of what you're saying, but the interpretation was much broader than what is in the law. I, I prefer that interpretation. I support and I think the majority of the Congress would. but. I, I think it's a valid point to make that there is a certain amount of judgment and discretion involved here. And I would hope that uh, we would continue to exercise that judgment and discretion and, and, and as I suggest, minimize the, uh, the, the disruption to uh, people's lives. And we're not just talking about federal employees, we're talking about the, the lives of American yes. citizens who pay their taxes and have a right to have that money spent uh, in the way that uh, they would, uh, they've come to expect and, and should be able to. That's right. But again, with the chairman's comment, we'll reverberate through the system. And as uh, uh, Mr. Munoz noted, every council and every department reminds all of the people making these judgments that it is, in fact, a statutory requirement with criminal penalties. Uh, and I know the chairman was uh, not necessarily uh, totally serious, but when you say, well, let's, shouldn't we provide prosecution for people who kept too many of people in X, Y, or Z positions, perfectly legitimate approach, but the answer is you can't, it's, there are judgments, but you have to understand this is, a, this is, I told the agency, this is not beanbag. This is actually serious uh, matters that affect, as you say, life and property, it affect the interests of the public, but it's one of those things we should bear in mind when we uh, ask questions like, and as the others have suggested, that we could have a shutdown for 30, 60, or 90 days, and wouldn't, what, what difference would it make? And what it would difference make, it would bring home even more significantly, as I noted in my testimony, even after 10 to 14 days, uh, the really catastrophic effects of talking about shutting down the government. So we ought to do, we ought to not gratuitously reach out to create any more problems than we have to, but you have to understand we're operating in a backdrop against the backdrop of the Congress not have providing authorization at all for any activities except emergencies. I, I understand the backdrop. I, I've, I've read the legal analyses. I, uh, uh, I, I'm just suggesting we exercise as much good judgment as we're capable of, which is a lot of it. And uh, we don't necessarily maximize our capacity for good judgment in every situation all the time. I, I, um, uh, I just have one quick uh, question uh, for OPM. Uh, you've got all the uh, health care plans, FEHBP, that uh, the open season is just closing. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of switching that's been going on this year because of the increase in premiums. Is, uh, is there going to be any problem in getting those affected on time by OPM if there uh, is a, uh, a shutdown on December 15th? Uh, no, there will, be, <coughs> there will be no impact because in terms of December 15th, OPM does have an appropriation and so all of our employees will be working uh, okay, on December. Uh, well, the, and the, in addition, but, Th those employees also. I thought also. they come from the agencies first, but I guess they go directly to OPM, uh, and you can make the changes necessary for those the agencies of whom the people are employed by whom the people. Yes, are I believe so. I believe that's the thank case. You can. Okay, all right, thank you. I thank uh, the gentleman. I think we're getting a clear definition here, Mr. Moran. I think that we can't jail the gardener but we can jail the <laughs> VA administrator who told the gardener go, go to work. We're, we're not, narrowing the... For those uh, gardeners who may be watching this, <laughs> I, I don't think you're, you're likely to be incarcerated anytime. Soon. I'd like to yield to the gentlelady from Maryland know, for uh, her I just wanted to ask, patience. perhaps um, uh, Mr. Schroeder, um, I wondered if you might elaborate on the issue of uh, the interruption of the private economy 
what the implications are in a shutdown? Well, in trying to assess what government functions can legitimately stay in operation uh, under the law when there's a lapse in appropriation, um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the cases you confront which uh, raises this issue most starkly is uh, the FAA tr air traffic controllers. Uh, so long as planes are flying, those individuals are obviously performing functions that are uh, necessary to avoid imminent threats to uh, the safety of human life. And as long as you make the assumption that they will stay operating, uh, we believe there's a valid justification under the law for keeping people in that kind of situation at their posts, even when there's a lapse in appropriations. It has been time, from time to time raised or speculated during prior shutdown experiences that the only justification under the law with respect to the FAA was to have them operate for whatever period of time it took them to safely land all the planes that were then aloft so that after three or four hours all the FAA employees in the various air traffic posts around the country who, were, who didn't have appropriated funds should walk off their jobs because they didn't any longer satisfy the emergency exception. We thought, and uh, Attorney General Civiletti thought, and it's been a consistent interpretation of past administrations, that in the situation of a short shutdown, it is legitimate to assume that private activity, over which the government doesn't have any direct legal control, will continue operation. So instead of sending out a warning to passengers all around the country, mm. don't fly after the first three hours of shutdown because the FAA controllers aren't there, we have made the other assumption that, that uh, we should assume that uh, that activity will keep going and it was beyond the legal requirements of the statute to literally close all of the commercial and non-commercial air traffic in the country. How did you determine um, what federal contracts should be continued or, or uh, uh, held in uh, abeyance during the, uh, the shutdown? Obviously there is a tremendous impact on the private economy when we have a shutdown. I'm wondering how the, those determinations were made. Well, there again, the fundamental again. legal guidance that we provide relates to whether, uh, to drawing a distinction between contracts for which there is funding and contracts for which there are not. Right. Under normal appropriations practice and under the terms of the Anti-Deficiency Act, where the funding is absent for the contract, uh, there's, no, there's no authorization for the agency to continue uh, incurring obligations during a period of lapse of appropriation. If a contract is funded with, with multi-year or no-year or indefinite appropriations, then those contracts can continue. So other than the FAA, purely on the basis of whether there is funding? Uh, excuse me? Except for FAA, purely on the basis of whether or not there is an appropriation, whether there's any funding for it. Yeah, that's right, with one small exception, and that is it is possible that contractors could be performing accepted activities for emergencies. Yeah. You may have building guard contracts or others where there may not be legal authority otherwise, as Mr. Schrader said, to continue the contract, but the f uh, function that they're performing is an emergency function, and therefore you can continue, you can incur that obligation going forward. But otherwise, in the absence of funding, uh, obviously those contracts terminate. Mm -hmm. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentlelady and also the ranking member and other uh, uh, colleagues uh, for their participation today and I want to also thank our witnesses. First of all, we do have additional uh, questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Schroeder, uh, Schrader, uh, we uh, cover, cover my base there with both uh, pronunciations, but uh, we have... Uh, I actually respond to either, either one. Uh, you should hear what I have to respond to sometime. <laughs> but, um, in any event, uh, uh, since we got your testimony late, we, we will have some additional questions probably from both sides of the aisle. Uh, Mr. Uh, Koskigan, uh, OMB, uh, if you could also send the subcommittee as soon as you get that uh, any revised uh, plans from the agencies, we'd, we'd appreciate that. So we have an opportunity to review what you're reviewing. Uh, and uh, Mr. Hewerman, uh, if you have any instances of overtime being paid uh, 
according to the memorandum which you issued, the uh, uh, subcommittee would also like that. We'll have some questions on that and also if you intend to keep this guideline for paying overtime for work that's... Uh, yeah, I, I, might, I might just mention in that regard, Mr. Chairman, that that guidance is the, uh, the same guidance that had been issued back in 1986 and 1990 based upon the same statutory language authorizing retroactive pay, which talks <coughs> about uh, paying people on their standard uh, rate I of think compensation. We, that might be something uh, we want to look at, but uh, we will have additional questions. I appreciate your participation in the uh, hearing uh, as witnesses. This is a, a very serious business government shutdown. Uh, this subcommittee doesn't have the authority or the charge to determine whether or not there will be a shutdown, but we certainly have the responsibility to see uh, if there uh, are instances where there are a shutdown. Uh, one, how we're prepared for it. Uh, two, what we've done in the past and what we're preparing for in, in the future. And also that we act in a responsible uh, manner, both uh, uh, for the public who depend on these services and benefits and activities uh, and uh, uh, also fulfill our responsibility as members of Congress. So uh, we thank you for your participation. And uh, Mr. Mr. Yes. if I could just say one uh, last word. I, I think the impression has been given that we've been, of course, looking for finding fault because this was a hearing to determine how the shutdown was implemented. Uh, it would be appropriate for the last word to be one of congratulations uh, to the gentlemen here, particularly in the agencies they represent, and in particular uh, to Mr. Koskinen, who uh, uh, was responsible for the operation of the government shutdown from OMB. Uh, he has the management section of OMB and really did do an outstanding job, as I think by any uh, reasonable measure you performed uh, with uh, with brilliance in a very challenging situation. So I, I would like to, to make that point. And uh, lastly, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask you publicly, do you think we could uh, uh, mark up a bill that would uh, mm. enable federal employees to uh, stay on the job mm. rather than stay off the job and get paid nevertheless? I think that that's one thing that we should consider and also uh, I think we'll have that opportunity to hear from you and other individual members who have uh, suggestions and there are some lengthy uh, suggestions and detailed suggestions for some improvements in the process. So I hope that we can uh, re, re uh, convene this uh, subcommittee on that subject uh, next week and hopefully make the changes that are necessary in the law. And uh, uh, you don't have to be a political sci scientist to uh, realize that there, in fact, are some tremendous uh, differences of opinion in, you know, with this, this Congress, this administration, with a new uh, freshman class to see that uh, that we could have more instances of uh, what we experienced just a few weeks ago. So uh, we should be prepared for it and uh, we'll consider that legislation. There being no further business to come before the subcommittee, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you. temporary spending bill signed between the President and Congress will expire on December 15th. If the two sides are unable to reach agreement on a budget bill, the federal government will be forced to shut down again. So far, six of the 13 fiscal 1996 appropriations bills that fund government operations have not been signed into law. Thursday, the President sent his budget plan to Capitol Hill. White House officials and congressional Democrats met with House and Senate Republicans to review the proposal. Today on our companion network, C-SPAN, we'll have live coverage from the Florida Democratic Party Convention. At 3 p.m. Eastern Time, the general session. Scheduled to speak.